welcome to An Evening with Nirvana. It's a podcast where I'll be talking to a series of guests from the Doom community, and perhaps some people from outside of it, about level design, map creation, and other facets of game development. Today on the podcast, I'm talking with Zazer, a member of the Doom community for 20 years. Zazer is one of the most prolific Doom mappers out there, having worked on a huge number of solo projects like Zen Dynamics, Dead Wire, and Dead Air. He's also been a part of innumerable community projects like Mayhem 17, Plutonia Revisited, Z Doom Community, Mapping Projects. He's also worked on big ticket megawatts like Eve Eternity, Back to Saturn X 1 and 2, and Heartland. So without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Cesar. How are you today? Pretty good. Oh, I guess I should do my all caps intro. Hello, I am a Zazer. Uh, pretend <laughs> I shouted that really loud. And uh, 20 years, great. I'm old. That's funny. <laughs> it is a pretty I don't wild sound like it. That's a big one. A little bit. Yeah, because like Doom is turning 30 next year. And so I get to say, oh, I've been working on silly mods for it for two thirds of its lifespan and well over half of mine. So uh, yeah. numbers are strange things. <laughs> It was it was uh, daunting, I will say. I went to uh, like your uh, Doom Wiki page, and I just kept scrolling. It, it was a lot. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, I hope you didn't burn yourself out trying to play through everything because uh, it yeah, it was a oh, I had to be, <laughs> I had to pick and choose for sure. I was telling you just <laughs> before the podcast uh, that Rubik's actually helped me pick out some specific words because he is sort of a bit of a Doom encyclopedia who has sort of played like. Pretty much most Doom ones, I would say. It was quite yeah, I'm, I'm totally curious what he suggested, just because, like, um, so I've been around in the Doom community for a while, and there's a lot of, like, folks that I, you know, talk to on a regular basis, and a lot of, like, creators that I kind of work with. And Rubik's is on, like, kind of the small little piece of, like, somebody who's, like, amazing and kicks ass, and yet I don't think we've ever really, like, talked or synced up or anything like that. So I'm just sort of like, oh my gosh, what, he plays my wads? What is he like? Yeah. So, well. so I'm at the ask at some point just because it's 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 fun but i guess that's one of the neat things about being in the doom community for a while is that uh you you it's still exciting whenever there's somebody who comes out with something like sunlust that's freaking amazing and then later on you found out that the person who made that played your maps it's like what huh why why is <laughs> why am i allowed to have that on or like it's weird it's good weird yeah, um, for sure. Well, I mean, you'll be interested to know that he <laughs> he suggests that I interview you. So there you go. <laughs> Thanks. He, uh, cool. He's well, definitely a fan of your stuff. Well, uh, same. I guess, I guess I I need to catch up a little bit because my uh, oh gosh, the last um, I I think actually this may have been the last time I was on a streamy sort of thing. Um, it was with uh, Bridge Burner and Arlene, and we were talking about Vesper, the gameplay mod for NBF twenty one, and I was using. Uh, Sunlust is kind of my testing ground for it, and it dawned on me how little I actually know the maps, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm terrible, I'm playing this on stream, and I suck. So, like, the last time I tried to, like, actually play through, um, it was, I was so embarrassed that I hope nobody noticed how terrible I was playing, so, um, I feel like just for that reason, and also because now I owe you one for this show, I need to go through and give it a real play, instead of just kind of flipping through the maps a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's definitely worth it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a pretty small list of, like, if you had to pick, like, three wads for somebody who's never played Doom before to play, like, that's got to be one of them. Like, have Eternity, oh, Sunlust, and then whatever weird wild card thing. <laughs> I think they'd definitely have a tough time if they'd, <laughs> if they'd never played Doom before and they went into Sunlust, but... It, it, I mean, I guess so. <laughs> if you if you jump in there on ultra violence, I guess that's kind of hard. But you know, maybe you play that one third, like work up to it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. It does. It, it doesn't take it easy, but uh, like in terms of like notable kick ass releases to tell people, here's the crazy stuff people have worked on. It's up there. So. Yeah. yeah definitely. Um, Pretty close to like a perfect mega award for me. Uh, I would mm -hmm. say. But. Uh, <laughs> So to go uh, way back from things like Sunlust and, and Vespa, how did you get into Doom uh, initially? Oh, geez. So this is, it's a weird story because I usually like think of bits and pieces of it, but when I, when I try to put it together in my head, it's actually hard because I was like a little tiny wee dude when I first saw the game, I was interested in it. Um, I, the very first time I'd seen it, I was like, a literal kid, the game had just came out and my dad was playing it, 
And so here's some five-year-old looking over being like, what is this thing? What's going on? What are you playing? Oh, I'm shooting demons. It's a thing called Doom. And I wasn't old enough to actually play the damn thing yet. And uh, But it, it it was kind of like this sort of strange mythical thing. Like, oh, it's that, that game dad plays. That looked cool. And uh, it was Christmas of 1997 was when I... First, like, I got some birthday present that was, like, a bunch of demo games on a CD, like, shareware versions of stuff. And one of them was Doom. I was like, holy shit, it exists. It's a real thing. So I plugged it and played it. Great. Hooked. Later on, found a copy of Ultimate Doom that my uncle had on CD and then installed that. And, well, oh, my gosh, there's more episodes. It's amazing. So it was just every time I would get exposed to And then later on, found a pirated copy of doom 2 on a random cd at my dad's house again wow. and it was just funny because every time i ran into like slightly more doom it was this weird thing where i'm like oh my god it does exist there's more what the hell <laughs> <laughs> um but so, so, but that's how i was introduced to doom but the parts of the story i always forget about is how that actually like wasn't so in between those little um segments of rediscovering doom um i actually played like heretic first before doom shareware funny enough and so my earliest memories were actually running around in like the docks not hangar so a lot of my really early running around trying to play 3d game things actually came from heretic episode one and then later quake 2 had had come out and i think i played the shit out of the quake 2 test demo before i even got that shareware copy of doom so like there were actually like two other games that that well no i guess that i'm trying to think of the when when the heck they clicked i don't know but somewhere in that vague nebulous i was a kid era i had played those three games around then and doom was the one that stuck i guess and then of course later on it's like oh heretic and made match for that too um but uh it's it's funny because it's hard for me to piece together an actual timeline of wait, when did I do this relative to that? Because I was like literally a kid. It's like, how do you even think back that far? Yeah. <laughs> so there's there. that's kind of the fun thing about it is how many hobbies are we into that it's hard to actually remember when you got started because it's hard for you to remember things in general. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, some of it is just, oh, it's been 20 plus years and so I'm old, uh, but I'm saying that with air quotes. Um <laughs> But some of it is just because, well, how much can you even remember when you're five? So, um, yeah. So yeah, it took a while for that to turn into modding. Um, I started playing around with that stuff as a, you know, early teenager. Um, I did a lot of screwing around with like D hacked and stuff before I ever even registered on a forum or started to to release anything publicly. And so there's actually a lot of like technically like lost Zazer content from before I ever put anything online. Um, but it all sucks, so <laughs> you're not missing anything. Um, <laughs> I think it was a... I forget if this was on Doom Radio or just a random sync up together over voice chat, but Alfonso, when he was around, mentioned at some point, like, wait, you you sucked at one point? I thought you just materialized, I don't know, or with good maps. I'm like, no, I had, <laughs> like, a full, like, five, six years of straight modding where everything was total garbage. <laughs> The only reason is I didn't release most of it. Like you've never been a subject to that. Like the uh, the oldest you can go back and actually play stuff of mine is like the really crappy old like Zedium weapon mods, and then um, a handful of like joke maps. But like I explicitly yeah. released them as joke mods, so people wouldn't wouldn't consider them shitty. But I at the time I think that was the best mapping it could have done. Like I was really bad. It's just I disguised it and didn't release <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so so it's weird. It's it's. I think more than anything else, Doom has just been kind of this strange planetary body in my life that I'm stuck in orbit around. And every once in a while, I'll be circling around and, oh, I'm trapped in Doom again. And then I try to circle away and, oh, it's got me again. So this most recent revolution hasn't let up for the last decade or so. But um, I, I haven't yet moved on anything else as far as I know, knock on wood. But I would be surprised if I actually ever fully escaped because it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. So... Um, long winded answer but there you go sorry <laughs> no good good answer for sure uh <laughs> yeah i wanted to talk about some of those like early weapon mods uh, a little bit um what sort of made you because you said you dived into like dhack stuff before you were even making maps so what made you more interested in creating weapon mods say than than getting into mapping 
Um, well, the shameful thing to admit is uh, it was easier. Like, that's what... <laughs> uh, like... I tried getting into level design and my gosh, it's really hard when you don't know what you're doing. Like making a door is a struggle, like trying to figure out how to draw lines and shapes that don't look terrible is a struggle. Figuring out how gameplay works is a struggle. But you open up DAC and you can make the chain gun like spin four times faster by just editing a couple of lines, hit save, and it feels like you've got so much power at your fingertips. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, I was playing a lot of mods at the time, uh, other people's maps, and I thought it was so cool that I could make some changes. And then I could play my changes with their levels. It was just amazing. I don't know why, but that that particular thing just always stuck with me. So um, it actually took me a damn long while to appreciate Doom's gameplay for what it was. And by that, I mean, like, I think it was Plutonia 2 when it first came out was one of the first times I actually sat back and was like, maybe I shouldn't load a mod with this and just play it as is. Uh, right. <laughs> and I did. And I was like, oh, shit. Turns out Doom is a pretty good game by itself. You don't have to mod it. But I had this whole kick for, like, up until that point where I just was, you know, oh, I don't want to just play with the same monsters and weapons. I want to change stuff. I want to change it, change it. And weapon mods were like a fun way to do it that at the time for me didn't feel as crazy hard as making an entire map. And then I could play it with any map I wanted. Like that was the, th those two things kind of sort of combined together. And um, you know, it was just fun, fun making guns <laughs> and other weird gadgets. So, right. And what do you generally sort of look to do with a weapon mod? Do you have, like, do you usually set out with, like, a specific theme or, or like, goal in mind? Um, nowadays, for sure. Like, back then, it was literally just throw shit at a wall to see what sticks. Or, here's a cool sprite, I want to use it. And that's all it was. Um, nowadays, I'm much more intentional about it. Um, the main thing for me is, like, so Doom's got, like, nine weapons. Um, or, I guess... Nine or ten. Uh, it's nine. I always have to f remember if I'm counting the SSG and chainsaw properly. Right. Um, and uh, that's a good number, but it's not infinite. And so, so you have to kind of understand how do the weapons work together. Like, um, let me. Sorry, I'm 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 mumble. I'm messing up my phrasing here. Uh, so there's typically a theme uh involved like like what aesthetic do i want for the weapons what's the actual kind of quote-unquote gimmick of the whole thing mm -hmm. but when it comes to actual individual weapon behaviors i like to make it to where each weapon kind of complements each other and there's a niche for most of them rather than have a bunch of redundant me twos and all that kind of stuff and yeah. uh because th there's all sorts of interesting weapon behaviors that you can make um and if you make two of them too samey, it's like the only difference between these two weapons is they use the same, or they use different ammo types. And sometimes you don't even get that. Like, as much as I love classic Doom, the super shotgun almost entirely obsoletes the single shotgun, and the chain gun obsoletes the pistol. So you kind of sort of almost have these redundant weapon slots there. So nowadays, there's always been this fun challenge of how do I make the starting weapons or the earlier weapons not completely like overshadowed by the later ones yeah. so 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 in vesper um your starting pistol is pretty decently powerful and it's the only like hit scan weapon so if you need to shoot somebody far away there you go and so by increasing the accuracy of that guy it turns out it's actually got a niche um the uh nail guns your standard plasma rifle sort of thing um the uh the nox grenades which replace the rockets uh are sort of like a super grenade launcher or a super rocket launcher where Huge explosion radius um, will kick the ass out of anything, but it leaves behind a very hazardous thing for your own health. So it's it's the extreme version of Doom's very powerful, but you can destroy yourself <laughs> if you're not careful kind of yeah. weapon. Um, and it, that's just kind of my process, if that makes sense, is to kind of make sure that each weapon has fulfills some kind of niche and isn't completely redundant with something else. It's not always possible, but um, that's... Uh, that's that's usually what my goal is like um so for anybody who's played heartland the that was a fun one because it was uh coming up with some interesting new weapon behaviors that kind of sat next to the doom arsenal and wasn't identical like the flamethrower has this close range radius damage kind of deal you kind of have to get in close but you can melt anything mm -hmm. um what i always thought was very interesting about classic doom's arsenal is that the plasma rifle 
is the strangest balanced weapon in the game because yeah. it's it's niche is weird it's basically an emergency panic button weapon like yeah. There's there's no penalty for using it up close. It can melt a single target, so it's kind of like a high single target DPS if you're caught in a corner. But then you get the BFG, and now you've got this problem where the plasma gun is a waste of ammo because the amount of damage you can do with a single BFG shot far eclipses what you can do with 40 cells with a plasma. So yeah. as it, as nice as the weapon is, it 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 again almost gets completely stomped whenever you pick up that uh the the you know the, the bfg and so like for heartland okay well let's make the bfg equivalent not use cells or flamethrower ammo in this case let's make it use rockets so instead the cluster bomb launcher is a super rocket launcher that you know you're only going to be able to use that guy in very large areas against very large crowds it doesn't completely obsolete the rocket launcher because it's going to fulfill a different niche than it um and it leaves as much ammo as you want for the flamethrower, so you don't actually get penalized by using it. So um, the ammo balance in general is just a, a very interesting puzzle to solve because Classic Doom's arsenal throws a lot of curveballs at you. There's the BFT plasma, and the other thing is your classic problem where um, the super shotgun uses two shells and does three times the damage. So you got to consider, okay, do I buff my single shotgun, or do I just consign myself to the fact that uh, one of my weapons is going to be way more ammo efficient than the other. Like, what do yeah. you do? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I know that was a kind of a rambly answer, but um, the other thing I've sort of, like, resigned myself to is when you're working on a weapons mod or any kind of gameplay mod, there's no such thing as perfect balance. Like, yeah. that you're, by design, changing the gameplay of maps that were never intended to play with your mod. Like, that's just a thing. And so there's only so much you can do before it starts upsetting the balance one way or the other. And, you know, you can always curb it, but um, I, I kind of had to accept the fact that it's never going to be perfect. Um, so it, that said, there is one way to sort of uh, defeat that, which is do what Heartland did and build maps around the weapons, not, <laughs> not just make a weapons mod and do it. So like for Vesper, I'd love to actually make some, some weapon sets. And there's actually some cool shit going on with Otomex right now uh, in that regard, um, which maybe we'll get to in a bit. But when it comes to actual weapon modding, that is just kind of a reality, is at some point you just kind of have to shrug and be like, you know what, this is going to upset the balance a little bit one way or the other, and it's just going to be fine. Because, you know, it, it's, it's not going to appeal to everybody. It's going to... It's gonna mess with the flavor because that's what you're doing. You're changing the ingredients around. It just that mm -hmm. it, that is what it is. So <laughs> yeah, I think well, um, you did sort of answer quite a few of the questions I had about about weapon modding. Uh, just yeah, uh, on your own there. That I ramble a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's good. Um, it streamlines the interview for sure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, is there ever any attempt to like with something like Heartland, you're trying to fit it into a like fit your weapons into a, like an established theme and stuff do you, is there like an attempt to make your weapon mods fit with doom uh or is there is like part of the fun just making weapons that have like no place in the game a lot of the time it's kind of both um i i wanted to try to keep heartland's weapons feel doomy so the sprites we picked um kind of mesh well with the original sprites because it is a mix of classic weapons and new ones. But since the uh, original weapons have the uh, higher frame rate animations on them, like they've got kind of the Smooth Doom sprites, or I guess a, a, a Zazer tweaked version of the Smooth Doom stuff uh, added to the WAD itself, we could kind of cheat a little bit when it comes to animations and kind of upping the, upping the fidelity of that a little bit. Um, but, but actually, yeah, that's nowadays I tend to try to pick sprites and weapons and things that are a bit doomier, if that makes sense, because, uh, you know, we, people modify the hell out of the game and you can do some, some really out there stuff like Natronian Chaos that just art style wise doesn't match Doom weapons at all. And it works like that's great. But for me, um, if I'm modifying just weapons, the maps the textures and the enemies are still going to be dooms. So if I stray too terribly far from the path, it's going to look like two different things at once. Like the, the styles are just going to clash with each other. So there's always a little bit of, um, I guess, uh, what's the word? 
there's a little bit of pressure, I think, in that sense to try to keep things a little doomy um, when it comes to aesthetics. And then behavior-wise, I'm always asking the question, does this fit in with the rest of the arsenal? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's now, funny enough, kind of a almost a decade old, but Zedem Community Map Project 2, ZDCMP2, was an interesting one because it added a bunch of new weapons on top of Doom's existing ones. And so at the time, my kind of self-challenge was, can I come up with new interesting weapon behaviors that fill niches that don't exist in Doom's arsenal? Like yeah. the flamethrower. Like there wasn't really a super close range piercing weapon. Uh, piercing weapons in general are just a thing you didn't see in Doom. There's no railgun equivalent. So, but the nail gun, you have your long range piercer, your flamethrower, which is your close range piercer. You've got your heat seeking uh, dark claw weapon. Um, the way the, 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 why can I not remember the names of my own damn weapons? Uh, <laughs> the solar render. The, the super BFG, how it works is really weird. Uh, although I say that, I guess it's just the Quake 2 BFG on steroids. Um, it's it's weird looking back at that one because I think it I think it was a bit too much because each weapon also had alt fires on top of stuff, so the weapons were a bit overloaded. Um, the idea certainly was to try to make stuff that complemented Doom's arsenal rather than replace it. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is it was a bit much, but that it fits the nature of the project. It was a big, huge Z Doom feature showcase for 2012, 2013 to show all the cool shit it could do. And so I guess sometimes less is more, but for that particular project, more is more. Like it fit. <laughs> yeah. Um I nowadays have, have kind of pulled the throttle way back when it comes to weapon features. I try to keep stuff pretty simple. Like it's got one fire, it does one thing really well. And there's not like 20 bazillion things you gotta memorize about this particular gun. So right, yeah. Well, I definitely um, want to talk about the compilation projects because they were they were a big deal to me when I first joined the community. So, mm -hmm. um, but before we get to that, uh, I want to talk about Zen Dynamics quickly, uh, which uh, you sort of start off the wad with like a little skippable intro sequence that gives some story. Uh, do you wish that Doom wads in general attempted to have like more of a story behind them? Um, I'm kind of indifferent when it comes to story. Uh, it's it's all about execution. Um, the absence of it is totally fine. If you do it, do it well. It's kind of where I where my head sticks on it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Zen's intro is more of a product of its time. Uh, back in the day, haha, that sort of Z Doom style Sarge is talking at you cutscene was kind of all over the place. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and. And so, you know, my younger self was mostly about, hey, let's do all this cool new stuff. Um, I didn't actually spend a lot of time really fleshing out the story or writing it. Like, it wasn't, there weren't any characters I cared about or a plot I really cared about. I think it was just more, you know, F it, I'm going to throw cutscenes at it because it's cool, which is not a great <laughs> approach. So modern me would not do what I did for Zen back in the day. Um, mm hmm but it's it's interesting though because there's not a whole lot of notable examples of i guess doom wads that have story as a very large component of them like there's a few every once in a while um but like rt rtc 3057 which is pretty old nowadays um you know tried to go full system shock with it which is pretty neat but um i think what kind of colors my opinions in that regard is uh i i love marathon also marathon's a great game and i played the oh, yeah. original yeah the original three and there's a lot of like marathon fan games like big basically megawatt equivalents and some of them have like really really good fleshed out stories mm -hmm. and so compared to those a lot of times doom wads are just you know pretty minimal so um i think if you were to take the modern zazer approach to how he would tell a story in a doom wad it would be something more like dead wire or dead air where there's yeah it's it's not necessarily trying to um, tell you a story as it is as much create an interesting setting and set the mood is is kind yeah. of where I go like environmental um, storytelling and stuff yeah like a, that's that's kind of where I lean towards nowadays um, mm -hmm. there's definitely now there there's actually another you know pretty big project in the works um, which I've done a little bit of work on um, supplies which does have a much more explicit story and so I'm doing a little bit of writing for that which is really cool. So, so there is one project out there in progress, which is doing the opposite of all these things, and we're actually doing some story and some writing and stuff, and that's a little fun and scary at the same time because it's just so different from 
yeah what i'm used to shipping but um i it's it's just interesting because looking back i've been around long enough and tried so many different things that i can many many times go back and look and be like huh i wouldn't do that again nowadays <laughs> and i think zen's intro is one of those it's just the way it's told kind of just linear cutscene. it's not really that interesting um i will applaud my past self though for allowing you to skip it just in the menu if you don't want to see it skip it yeah i Great. thought that was cool actually it was definitely not something that happened back in the day you're usually locked into watching little doom man standing there yeah um <laughs> yeah you <laughs> And even then, uh, I, I, just, I don't know why it dawned on me, but I just used the episode select menu to let you skip past it because the, the intro cutscene is its own map. And so I was like, okay, well, one of the maps starts at cutscene map and the other starts at uh, map one and there's your episode select, easy. Uh, I think um, with Zen in particular, one thing that's interesting about it is the original... So, so have you looked much into like the history of it, or well, I guess I should probably say it for the cast where people yeah, haven't yeah. seen it. Just uh, you can continue with your your deep lore about Zen Dynamics. For sure. <laughs> oh gosh, uh, me me rambling. It's gonna happen a lot. Um, Zen Dynamics was it it was an A ten warthog. <laughs> it was a a megawatt, or I guess not even a megawatt. It was a map set that was built around the guns, not vice versa. Uh, right. literally back in the day, um, there was no such thing as running ACS outside of a map. Like you couldn't do it. And so I came up with this, well, I really just built a script on top of what a lot of other people had, had written, um, which let you have a bindable reload key that would let you reload guns, but it would only work in custom maps. Like I was like, oh shit, I can't just play this one in any old level because it has to run my script and the only way to include my script is to make a map. And right. so the entire like original Zen Dynamics first 1.0 release, I threw it together in two weeks because I discovered this reload hack and I needed to put together some maps really quickly to show it off. Um, so for those not in the know, um, back in the day, Malcolm Saylor uh, of Chord fame, he released an old like scraps set on id games, like msscraps.zip. And I literally just took a bunch of those, threw some monsters in it, built some crappy areas around them and released in dynamics and i was even even back then as a kid who was kind of sort of full of himself frankly i was still like really surprised a lot of people played it and liked it and i'm like oh that's weird i didn't i didn't think this would take off because that was a throwaway project it was just oh, i had a neat idea let me throw something bullshit it together in two weeks and i had some other grand plan for some other crap i was wanting to build that of course never materialized and i was just sort of like wait why are people talking about this random nonsense rather than the thing i was planning to do it was a uh, the <laughs> the the simpsons back in the day was just a random napkin sketch of, of throwaway characters because he didn't give a shit about them and that took off and the thing he was wanting to actually uh make didn't <laughs> it was kind of like that um <laughs> right so Happens, so yeah. yeah but the first release didn't have a story it didn't didn't have like the secret levels it it was missing so much stuff and so because people played it and liked it i was like i guess i may as well keep working on this and so the final version that you play now was like a year or two it, it was a lot more work afterwards and so the whole mm -hmm. thing was built backwards the weapons came first and then the maps were just thrown together and then i kind of put a story on top of it because it turned into well i guess if i'm making this a thing i may as well do what i want to do with it and it needs a little bit of story because it seems like it needs one. Um, I wouldn't do it nowadays, but back in the day, I was like, all right, fine, F it. Here's a silly little story <laughs> about a guy and a trader and a shapeshifter and whatever. Had to be um, done for Zedon back in the day. Yep, yeah, it just, it, it kind of nowadays feels like younger me was checking the Zedon box box tick. Uh, that sentence got away from me, but you get it. It was like, oh, I, yeah, I, I guess this is a real project now. I may as well treat it as one. Here's what I need to do. So I did it. <laughs> It's well, a silly. going through your stuff, I definitely, you've done so many unique <laughs> things, like just so many, like weapon mods and you know, general mapping, and then big community projects and and stuff. But one thing that kind of caught my eye that I thought was pretty unique was Doom: The Lost Episode, which is uh, like a compilation of like the PSX and Jaguar maps and things like that. Uh, what made you want to like collect those maps up and then and then put them together? I don't know. It was just kind of this this weird mystique of wow, there's official maps out there that almost nobody knows about. At the yeah. time, 
aside from like you know there, there were people who grew up with PSX Doom and it was fairly well known but there was a whole group of us PC players that had no idea what like Twilight Descends and Threshold of Pain were it's like well, there's an entirely new official map and um Lost episode itself though is a weird project because I'm not I'm not dissatisfied with what it is but I I'm really embarrassed on how I did it back in the day because um, it was a pretentious ass mess. I basically was like, fuck it, I'm going to take this stuff and I'm going to pretend that it's a real episode five. This is before Doom the Way It did. And I was just sort of like trying to be like, hey, here's a new quasi official E5. It's going to be so cool and all this stuff. And it's just looking back at all those old posts and all the, and the text file and all the marketing blurb about it. It's like, wow, the guy who made this project was up his own ass. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because what it actually turned out was is it's a very bizarre remix of a bunch of levels. Like um yeah. the very the very first room you start out in is sort of like this non-Euclidean nightmare. And I remember an old id games review that said opened wad, saw first room, closed wad zero out of five. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I respect that. <laughs> because the id games reviews it, were were brutal, yeah. I they, just they generally didn't. speaking, but but also I yeah. feel like people did not really appreciate this project was just compiling wads that you guys didn't really make. Like uh, um, pe people seem to be like, why would you make this map or <laughs> or whatever? But you know, well, I think maybe the problem necessarily wasn't that it was um, it was all the shit that I was doing that wasn't that because uh, I I I basically kind of sold the whole project as. Here's some lost maps. It's like an official E5 using official maps. But like I made so many modifications and just weird shit to them that it 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 was marketed as here's id, but what it actually was is here's Zazer doing weird Zazer shit. Right. <laughs> so I, I again I'm not I'm not dissatisfied with how it turned out. It's been aged in a lot of areas. Like there's a lot of stuff I wouldn't do um nowadays, but I I just wish that I had been more like frank about what it really was which is hey i'm just making this weird personal remix of some stuff and you guys can have fun with it or not because the reception yeah. at the time was actually a pretty strong reaction not to what the project was but everybody's expectations were way off because i kind of sold bullshit like i told everybody here's some quasi official stuff and people played it was like this is way out there what are you talking about dude like like what is this mm -hmm. so i most of the negative reaction i think wasn't actually in response, at least my view of it, looking back, was people weren't weirded out because it was a remix. Uh, they were weirded out that it was too much of one. That I sold it as, here's, here's a, a, a compilation of maps, but it actually was Zazer is just tweaking the shit out of everything, which mm -hmm. would, would have been fine if I was sort of honest about what I was doing, I think. So right. when I look back at it, it was a weird project, and I feel strange about it, but I don't feel about strange about what i did it was more about how i sold it <laughs> yeah like saying sold with air quotes but yeah <laughs> gosh it's so cringy reading back all those old posts it sucks <laughs> well it's i mean a very long time ago now so you know i think we change. yeah we all have those those uh, moments i guess but i think the funny thing about it is that it was this was well before doing the way it did was a thing so the whole idea of hey, let's do stuff like the old masters. Like, that didn't exist yet. That wasn't really a thing. So um, I didn't know what I was doing, but also nobody else was doing that thing either. Um, I, mm -hmm. I don't believe there was any sort of, like, influence that project to Doom the way it did. Like, like there's there's really not. Um, but I think that me, me getting interested in that idea definitely contributed to me wanting to contribute to Doom the way it did because when it came around and people were making a more, um, you know, a, a much better effort of wanting to kind of do that thing I tried to do back in the day, I was like, all right, let's give this another shot and let's do this for real. And it turned out much better, yeah. basically. Well, that was so, sort of my next thing that I wanted to ask you about actually was Doom the way it did. Um, did you, what, did you like learn unique things about? Uh, iWod maps from studying them. Did you study the iWod maps specifically, or did you just look at sort of the the basic guidelines and then uh, work from there? Um, I studied the shit out of the iWod maps. We we all kind of so the um so this is a fun blast from the past because uh, Doom the way it did and Back to Saturn X kind of both 
we're around this interesting transitional phase where vanilla doom suddenly became an interesting thing for people because um right before that was the era of kind of gz doom needs more detail tm people were sort of like super excited about things uh simplicity came out which kind of challenged the idea of hey you can make the maps look nice without going over with, with z doom stuff and then suddenly there was kind of this uh I'm, I kind of point at Plutonia 2 being kind of one of the big kickers for it, because here's this really massive, like, widely celebrated, really good vanilla Doom megawad that got a lot of people interested in the old Doom. Um, and then suddenly somebody had this goofball idea of, hey, what if we actually literally make maps that feel like a tenth map in the original episodes? And that just snowballed, because everybody thought it was a cool idea. Um, but, you know, th this was slightly before Back to Saturn X. But the thing that's so weird about it is that the first Doom the way it did, and the second Doom 2 the way it did, were wildly different projects when it came to, I guess, approach and everything, really. Because the first Doom the way it did was literally a bunch of people just throwing shit at a wall to see what sticks. There was no organization. There was no, It was kind of more like an, an idea than a project. It was a, uh, oh, I don't know. It's the difference between um, a potluck and opening a restaurant, I guess. Um, I, that's a very weird analogy, but... Um, <laughs> right. the, the, the basically, so Hellbent, who started Doom the way it did, he, he, he was kind of sort of the champion of the idea and, you know, fostered discussion, all that kind of stuff, but he never really made an effort to sort of compile anything together and get things... So there were so many concepts and ideas and stuff that people would kind of throw out there, but nobody was really sort of, like, leading the show. And so, like, for whatever reason, just me being me, I kind of jumped in and started, like, okay, here's a compilation of some maps I think work, and, you know, some people gave feedback, like, these aren't good, these seem to work, or whatever. And then there were some other people who started to step in, were like, hey, you know what, maybe we should actually make this, like, a proper wad and not just a bunch of ideas. And so that was back when, like, Essel got involved, and 40 Ounce, and some other people, and, and, and funny enough, Hellbent was kind of sort of, like, mostly, like, yeah, you guys can do what you want, and I'll chip in a little bit, but he, he kind of you know, step back more or less, or I guess was kind of there. So the things that happened around this period that, you know, definitely influenced the direction of the wads was uh, there was a big fallout between Mr. 40 Ounce and the rest of the crew, mostly over, like, I don't remember all the specific details, but there was a lot of arguing over whether or not maps, you know, made sense and were id-like or not. And eventually it ended up leading to a big blow up um with 40 ounce pulling his stuff and leaving and you know th there's a whole lot of drama around that guy that you know is i think way beyond the scope of this uh interview yeah, but right. <laughs> that project was when all that started like that was the first sort of um chink in the armor like like kink in the chain or whatever the hell that was that was the very first 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 time where he started to rub we're up against people the wrong way and kind of kind of jump ship and whatnot. And so so he left and then a few other people were like, fuck, I guess we need to pick it up from here and make it a thing. And I was mostly kind of from the, watching from the sidelines at that point. And Project Resolution was pretty decent. And then somebody got the idea of doing Doom 2 and like Tarnsman Essel, all that kind of sort of made that happen. Um, and I was at that point, I was just sort of like contributing a little bit and the, the gears had already started turning. But basically the first project, oh, I didn't even point out Elmo. Elmo back in the day was like one of the big, he actually was the main organizer of the first project and helped a little bit with the second because he put together the, the app that everybody used to submit the maps. Like there was an actual like app on Heroku where people could submit levels and it would list everybody's levels and what episode they were on. It's really cool. I think it's archived somewhere and linked in the Doom Wiki, but it was like this weirdly high effort thing that somebody put together to just track all the submissions because there were like hundreds of them. It's crazy. Um, but so Doom the Doom the way it did the first one was the strange organic mess that happened to like eventually result in a project. And Doom 2 the way it did was the exact opposite. It was a very focused, concert, like directed effort from a team to basically say, hey, we're going to do Doom 2 and we're actually really going to study it and we're really gonna nail it. And uh the reason I sort of like pointed that out is because uh, that was about the time when I realized, huh, I'm actually not good at this. <laughs> like like uh, mimicking other author styles is really, really, really hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my map for Doom 2, the way I did map 28 of this is kind of supposed to be Sandy Peterson, but it's not really. And people let it in anyway, because I guess they liked it. But um, 
it it's it's definitely one of the least eye maps in the whole set because um, mm -hmm. it turns out that just going full full you know get exactly in the headspace of sandy or john or any of the other uh ogs is just hard like at the end of the day i want to do my own thing it's circling back to the lost episode thing like I'm saying I want to make it like an official E5, but what I'm really doing is putting my own spin on it. And so after, you know, Dune 2 the way it did, that was sort of a, not necessarily a gigantic turning point, but I think that was the time when I realized I'm having fun doing what I'm doing, but I don't want to try to make any sort of pretense about I'm making some cool thing that's that's some goal. It's just more like I'm making what I'm making. That's, that's what it is. I, I don't. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to make this something it isn't, if if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, weird, did, did you notice phrase. anything, like, when you were working on Doom 2 the way you did, did you notice, like, specific uh, differences between the design elements in, like, uh, the first game and the second game that you tried to play off? Um, personally, I... Gosh... I was never as plugged into the process as most of the other folks on the team, so it's hard for me personally to weigh in on what I looked at. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, the element that influenced my map a lot was verticality, like having a very, very large open vertical space is something that you see in Doom 2, but not Doom 1, like the living in, that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't see a whole lot of that in the first game. And so levels like downtown and industrial zone were just... Those are the kinds of things that kind of stick out in my mind as one of the biggest differences between the first and the second game in terms of just pure map aesthetic. Um, right. it, it, the levels feel much larger. One of the reasons why is because they're tall. Like, like, sure, they take up the same surface area on a 2D plane, but they're really large on the vertical axis. And so I just wanted to play with that, like kind of a pseudo chasm, interesting sandy box experience that has a lot of jumping between platforms. Like that, that was my whole thing. So, mm -hmm. but I focus more on those kind of broader goals. Um, a lot of people on the team got really, really, really nitty gritty. Like they could tell you, here's how John Romero used support three. Uh, <laughs> turns right. out there's a lot of, there's a lot of support three on 32 unit line defs, which means that you've got a bar and a half and it cuts off and that's just all over the place in the IWADs. And, uh, the, the, you know, some of the maps that Essel and Tarnsman and some of the other folks did are just like, it's kind of absurd how close they got on all the minute, small details. And that's the part I could never get the hang of. Like, my map's too clean. It's not quite as dirty enough as Sandy. I didn't want to make it any dirtier, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but it, at that level, I guess, when you start drilling down to the really, really tiny stuff, it's hard for me to, I guess, analyze it at that small of a level. For me, it's all more about the feel, the idea, the, the, the broad strokes I did in than it is anything else. And... Um, I guess what's interesting is if you want, if anybody wants to play Scholar and compare and contrast, is take a look at Doom 2 the way it did, and then take a look at uh, uh, Doom the way it did Lost Episodes. Because Lost Episodes had a lot of levels which were like, I kind of went in and tweaked them up and fixed them up a little bit and then released it. Mm -hmm. But at that point, since this was the outtakes pack, there was there wasn't really any pressure to really make them IWAD like. And so what I would always focus on is what is this map trying to do that makes it interesting? And what can I do to make that part stick out? Like like how how do I make this map's quirks awesome? Yeah. As opposed to how can I make this map like Sandy Peterson? So it was more like finding finding its uh je ne sais quoi, as it were, and make it make it sing. I, I sound really cheesy when I say things like this, but that was <laughs> That was my process at the time, as opposed to, like, hell, that was what Knowing to Sight more or less was. It was start trying to make a Doom the way it did map, and then when it inevitably starts going off course, just follow that course to whatever its conclusion is, because it's it'll probably be something interesting. So mm -hmm. that was always, the for me, the number one goal, which which I think put me at odds, you know, we never, like, super argued much, but the, the thing that my approach was always so different from Doom to the way it did the proper team's was I always wanted to be, well, is it cool? Is it, does it feel good? Is it interesting? As opposed to, is it authentic? Yeah. Which, you know, it makes sense. It's, you know, it's, that, that wasn't the project tool. My, my personal, what I wanted it to be, wasn't what it should have been. So uh, 
but that's kind of subtly what led to these other projects existing. Like no end in sight was literally myself and natural 20 being like, you know what, let's make our own thing because I think our, what we're contributing is just a little bit too off for doing the way it did. Let's, let's make our own thing. And we did right. and it worked out. Um, <laughs> so I guess if you want to, again, get into the drama thing, it's interesting because, you know, 40 ounce butt heads of people and big falling out with a lot of stuff. And I also technically butted heads with, you know, project philosophies and stuff, but I took that to a positive place and just wanted to be like, you know, you know, I'll just make a thing over on the side and then I'll, you know, tweak my submission for the proper thing. But this other thing doesn't fit. But I'll just make it work elsewhere. And mm -hmm. turns out a little side you do that, everybody's happy. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's the best thing to do is you don't have to take your toys and go home. You can take your toys and play with them and still contribute. Like there's no, you don't have to leave a project in order to also make a second one, I guess. Yeah, is what that's I'm true. To yeah. So could help a lot of community everyone. projects, I think. <laughs> uh so as a more general question like you've worked in like pretty much every format uh, at this point I, I was curious what i guess your thoughts are like whether you have a preference between udmf boom and, and vanilla maybe some things that you like and dislike about each format or something um it it usually depends on what i'm wanting to make and that's kind of a throwaway answer but mm -hmm. like most of the time i'll pick boom or actually mbf 21 now just because um, I guess the more I've gotten quote unquote older, I've settled into this interesting middle niche where hell, MBF 21 is exactly this, where it's like, hmm, I don't want the game to be exactly the originals. I want to be able to change stuff, but I'm not quite at the point where I want to hundred percent Zen dynamics, customize everything and, and about, about like, there's a big difference between my earlier weapon mods, like even stuff like psychic versus airy guns and vesper and things that i released much later like those are much more grounded and closer to the original game than like these wild new gameplay remixes and i feel kind of the same about maps like if i'm sitting down to make some stuff in an editor i don't i probably don't want to reach for really fancy scripting or uh dynamic lighting or all that kind of stuff like what for whatever it is the the core kind of basic stuff that you get in boom or I guess now MBF 21, tends to scratch the itch for the most part. Um, I think even, even things like Deadwire and Dead Air, they're much more reserved compared to a lot of GZ to maps. Like, like the stuff that Bridgeburner and company are cranking out is like a bazillion times more high def than I could ever imagine myself making something. It's just, I don't know. It's it's I think what it is is I've fallen in love with Doom's like. It's got this amazing balance of simplicity and power where you can draw a few lines and make it look really, really good without spending a bazillion years uh, pretending to be an environment artist and making that one little scene look pretty. Because um, trying to go in any like newer engine, even the stuff that you see in modern Quake mapping looks fucking amazing, mm -hmm. but it's so it takes so long to produce that content because it's so amazingly detailed that I guess for me, I've just settled in this niche where I kind of like... You know, the, the NEIS kind of, I, people are calling it something like neoclassic, I guess. Like, whatever syringe is. Like, that's my comfy mapping zone. And yes. uh, usually it's, I, I don't feel the need to reach for uh, UDMF for that. I just kind of be like, ah, we'll just do boom, maybe F21, something like that. Yeah. Um, but if I'm mapping for Square, of course, it's UDMF. If I'm doing a thing for a GZDM project, I'm not going to not use UDMF. That's, there, there's no sense in trying to, stick in the middle zone somewhere like if you're if you're doing something that is fancy like udmf is the format for sure mm -hmm. yeah. um but if you just you know block me in a room and said make a map no restrictions i'm just probably going to pick the mbf 21 config and start doodling lines like that's just my default nowadays so yeah it is it is a great All right it's become mm -hmm. uh maybe a slightly nicer middle ground <laughs> now uh than I even boom, so. but, yeah. yeah i mean there, there's it seems like there's been a lot of releases lately. Um, the the kind of speedrunning community and the challenge mappers have really like taken off with it. There's some there's some yeah. cool shit that's being released and people are like using the features and yeah, I'm I working guess... on some stuff now with it too. And it's, <laughs> it's got a yeah. lot of like really unique ways to kill the player. I think. <laughs> nice. Yeah. There's there's some fun stuff you can do. Even just the presence of an insta death floor type is just night it's and day huge. difference. Like, there's... Yeah, it makes such a big difference to building encounters yeah mm -hmm. 
So um, I'm just really, really happy to hear that it's taking off and people are playing with it because um, it's scary when you launch something like that, especially something that's meant to be a broad community standard because, um, well, I had a lot of things to say about that. Uh, I just didn't know if you wanted to switch topics or not. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I did actually want to go <clears throat> go back a little bit. I did want to talk about the Zdoom community mapping projects because... Um... Oh, yes. People may find this weird to know because I like I I map for Boom for the most part, but um, I did start off mostly being active on the ZDoom forums and the ZDoom community <laughs> mapping projects were like probably the two like P words that like excited me the most when I first started uh <laughs> getting into like custom content. So oh, I that's guess, awesome. Yeah, I was wondering um like considering like the scale of the projects and the amount of ACS involved and stuff. Did it feel like working on, like, a standalone game at times, working on those? Oh, boy. It it, it did. And uh, there's a couple of projects that, in hindsight, I get a little grumpy about. Um, and that's one of them, because it's... I try, I try not to be too hard on Torm, although nowadays he's kind of, you know... <laughs> he's dug himself into a lot of holes, let's just say that. Um, but the short version is ZDCMP2. Like, one, I just threw some shit at a map and somebody else made it better and that was whatever. It's barely involved in the first one. The second one, uh -huh. um, I wanted to just make weapons for it and leave. But I after I got, you know, they they let me make some cool weapons and I added them to the game and then I got too attached to it. And the project was actually kind of not managed that well. It was really, really messy. Um right. the trouble was so the original format was each mapper had a two-week slice of time that you would sign up for in advance, and so you'd work on it for two weeks and pass to the next person. It works in theory. The trouble is there was no any sort of effort made in between to sort of ensure that the map wouldn't completely spiral off the rails. And it kind of was. Like, everybody was just trying to do their own thing. There was no coordination. Um, basically, there was this two-week period where one of the mappers had just ghosted. Like, it was just some new person who signed up and then never posted again, funny enough. Um, and I took it. The, I took a look at the map and was like, "Hey guys, you might just mess with this for a bit." And Tom was like, "Oh sure," because it was just this maze. It was this this convoluted mess of everything was locked down. The navigation was a nightmare, and oh gosh. so I I don't. I'm a little grumbly, but it's my fault. I just got too involved, and so I basically sort of like jumped in and started trying to coordinate making the map progression something because. Unfortunately, there was no plan. So mm -hmm. a lot of the weird things you do in the map, like get the flamethrower to burn the vines and all those signs that point you where that. to go and the objective system, a lot of that was just me throwing stuff to try to figure out how to not make the player get lost. Mm -hmm. um, and what was like so, the collaboration process for that like? Like, did you all just work on your sections separately for the map and then piece it together or... Like, how was the map moved around from person to person? It was, uh, basically, when it first started, the first person would work on the map, and then they would post the wad, and then the second person would take the wad and add their stuff and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, what it eventually turned into, because, again, I kind of sort of assumed this role, I guess, and Torm let me do it, was when it became somebody's turn, then... We would just message each other on at the time IRC and just talk about it and plan stuff out. Like I always jumped in, was like, okay, what are we gonna do? Let's figure out how to make this work and whatnot. And a couple of the mappers were just freaking awesome and were like, yeah, sure, let's figure out how to make this work and whatever. Um, so there's this one particular spot in the map that that really I think exemplifies, I think the what I saw as the big problem of the project was all right, so. The very first segment of the map where you start on, Torm made it, and it kind of is this junction where there's, there's a door in the center you can't go to, and you can go to the left and go to the right where the vines are. The vines didn't used to exist, but it was just a doorway that nobody had mapped on. So the very first person went off to the left and added some stuff. And then every person after that just kept adding stuff to the left and never at any point attempted to bring stuff back to the center. <laughs> right. Except one guy, one, one person, Pyroscourge, put this cool-ass, awesome arena in the middle and then nobody else connected to it. And I was like, what the, why are you not bringing it back to the central like hub that's clearly there? Nobody ever tried to do it. And 
uh, I worked with some folks to kind of bring in the vine parts and, and you know, like, okay, we're going to do this and you're going to access the second half, half of the map. And we did all that kind of stuff. And so we finally got all that kind of stuff set up. And uh, the, 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 like, the one, the thing that drew me the most insane, and you'll see this in the map, is after the corridor where you burn the vines, so we set all that up and it was a placeholder and we're like, cool, awesome, we got the map on track, we got the central arena up top with the door to the side and you got a thing off to the right and now there's a cool new wing of the map people can expand to and there's a place to bring everything back when they're done. And we pass it off to the next guy and then he makes a little hallway to the right of the vines and there's a bend and it curves and it goes south. The wrong fucking direction. Like, no, why are you building Oh, that's not where that is. What are you? It's it's a stupid thing to get to to go crazy about, but like I had basically spent all this time trying to figure out how to get the map progression back on rails, and the exact next person who grabbed the map built it and started going in the completely opposite direction of where I wanted it to go. I'm like, oh god damn it! And <laughs> I literally the next person in line after him, I DM'd him was like, hey. I hate to ask you to do this, but would you mind building your stuff to the north and try to connect together? And he said, sure. And he did. And he said, it all worked out. But like, for better or worse, I just sort of like inserted myself into the middle of the project there because nobody was doing it. And I was just really worried that if, if it never happened, it would have just turned into a big sprawling mess. And I don't know if that would have been true or not. But for whatever, it seemed to work out, I guess. But mm -hmm. it was kind of sort of, that was my... MO at the time, unfortunately, is I would get involved in a project, and then because I had something in it, I got too involved and I couldn't figure out how to give it up. And ZDC and P2 was me trying to play dictator a little bit and everybody being really cool with it because nobody else is doing it. And there were a couple other projects, most notably TNT2, which ended up turning into a very different scenario, but it was another kind of case where I was involved in a thing and, and it was, you know, on on that thread of being of, of collapsing and so i kind of looked at it was like fuck somebody's gonna have to try to fix it i guess i might as well give it a shot mm -hmm. and so there were several projects at the time that were kind of some some form of that help doom the way it did was that it was i was the first person to start trying to compile stuff together because i was just really worried like here's a really cool project that doesn't seem like it's going to be a thing unless somebody steps yeah. in to make it happen i mean so, you often need i feel like a lot of doom community projects kind of need that person to, uh, to come in Perhaps because it's like a hobbyist kind of community, you know, so uh, sometimes there's less like uh, maybe pressure on people to like finish off these these projects. And so a lot of them just kind of linger around for way too long. Yeah, you do need that kind of coordination for most things. Um, and looking back, I don't necessarily regret that I did those. It was more like how I did it, because in those cases, in those projects, I didn't ask for permission. I didn't really talk with the project leaders and said, do you need a hand? I just kind of did it. And looking back, that's the weird part. So there's been a few other things in recent years where I've kind of helped out folks and gotten involved in some of the, you know, tech fixes or compilation process, blah, blah, blah. But I always make sure to, like, ask and be like, are you cool with me doing this? Is, is this fine? I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help out, but I don't want to, like, take your project away from you because I straight up just did that in, in a few cases. And I think I'm lucky enough that, like, everyone was kind of fine with it. Like, Florm was fine with it. Uh, the the um, TNT2 was basically like shattered and needed somebody and nobody owned it. Uh, Doom the way it did, Hellbent was, I guess, fine with it. I, it's just weird because in, in hindsight, uh, the, the kind of oopsie that I made socially was I just never really tried to reach out before doing it. I just kind of assumed control, which is dumb. Uh, I'm glad that that didn't end up ruffling feathers, I guess, but it, it's, it, that's kind of just what, how that went down, if that makes sense. Right. So it was a bit stressful and I know that that may not necessarily be the answer you were looking for, because it sounds like you, you really like the wad and that's great. And I'm people, it, it people loved it when it came out and I was like, Oh shit, thank God. It was, it was a relief <laughs> that it, the things I was super afraid of, like everybody getting lost and it feeling like a mess, didn't come to pass. I mean, it's definitely a big smorgasbord of features, but that's kind of what it was meant to be. So I think everybody's expectations were pretty in line with reality, I think. So it didn't yeah. feel overwhelming because that's what people signed up for when they played it. Well, yeah, I think um, uh, you kind of understood that it was going to be 
I wouldn't say like the what it feels coherent, but you know, everyone labeled their sections on the map and stuff. You kind of knew it was like meant to be. Now I'm experiencing this little section that's like a bit different from the previous one. So I don't think those feelings of incoherency really hurt it, uh, in my opinion. Sure. I mean, I guess it is a thing where it's it's straight up said from the outside, like it is the Zedum Community Map Project number two. Like in the name, it's telling you there's a lot of people who work on this, so people don't get surprised when there's, I guess, quote unquote, stylistic inconsistencies, which is yeah. an important thing. Is if nothing else, that was one thing that was nice about that project was that there was no it. It was the opposite of something like Doom the way it did, where there was no pressure to try to make things stylistically consistent, because that wasn't the point. Uh-huh. So you could have a section that just looked like that mapper style, and that was totally fine. There, there was there was no issue with that at all. So that was one good one really good thing about it is that there wasn't a whole lot of, I guess, pressure for for everybody to conform to anything. So that was that was cool, and and that that aspect of it actually seemed to work out pretty well. Like um. There was a few sections later that got some detail from other people's after the fact, but I think that was mostly, um, you know, everybody was cool with it. Like, the hell section, like, the entire, like, last third of the map, like, Phobos did all that. Like, he was just like, fuck, we need a hell part. I'm just do the whole thing. And <laughs> um, lots, of a, lots of the rest of us, like, I, I did some, a bunch of tweaks to it. And I think some other mappers got involved. Like, I, I think Torm did some things. I just forget what. Um, but you know, Phobos, I think is cool with everything. It's like, oh yeah, sure, you can just detail and add some more things. But we didn't like rip out his parts, and it didn't feel like we needed to do anything like that. Like, oh, I can't believe you did this. Let's replace it or whatever. Like, for the most part, we uh, kind of built built new stuff next to each other's. And the most, even though I talked about myself like I was some kind of evil project dictator, it was more, hey, let's try to figure out how to get the next guy's section to connect with everything else. Um, rather than let's completely replace everybody's areas or whatever. So um, I think the the now I do want to really quick before we move on. There was one cool little I think positive lesson that I actually um, dawned on me when I was working on the project that I've taken forward to almost everything I've done. So mm-hmm. one really awesome cool mapping lesson in there. So the the first third of the level, like the the base section in the west. It's pretty open. You can explore it in almost any order. Like there's a couple of objective points, but it's it's pretty nonlinear. You can kind of sort of like bounce around and explore it in a lot of different directions. Um, it didn't used to be that way. It used to be a very switch hunty maze trying to figure out how to get from A to B because you know there are lots of locked doors and one way paths and all sorts of stuff. And you know, in, in one of my earlier sort of I'm going to jump in and insert myself into the project kind of moments, I looked at that and was trying to solve that. And the solution that came to my mind was, what if I just remove all the stops and let you go anywhere? Because mm-hmm. the problem was the player was getting lost. They were asking the question, where do I go? It turns out that a valid answer to the question, where do I go, is anywhere. Uh, and right. uh, it was just this interesting sort of epiphany is the most confusing maps are the ones that are not linear enough that there's only one way to go but they're not nonlinear enough that you have a choice. It's right in the middle where it's like, it looks like it's open, but there's one particular path in the corner that you have to find. That's when things are at their most confusing. If it turns out that there are like 20 different ways to get to your objective, then you can just kind of stumble around and find it eventually. Um, so, so that was, it's just an interesting sort of moment, especially in Doom mapping where you have an auto map. It turns out that making stuff more open is a lot of times a like a good solution for solving um progression problems like if the player is lost then just make it to where they can safely get lost and they don't yeah, exactly. know exactly where to go like that's that's it's valid and so that was the map that taught me that was it turns out that like taking out all of those switches and doors and stuff and just opening it all up fixed that problem now mm-hmm. I still don't think the map would have worked without the objective system. Like that was kind of a band-aid on top. So it was sort of a slant example because like, okay, it worked, but it didn't. But that 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 idea of taking and you know using a lot of places is like, okay, in this area it's pretty open. So I'm just gonna make sure that there's three or four or five ways to get to the objective instead of just one. Because mm-hmm. that's where you get into trouble is if it's open, but you but if there's 19 paths and only one of them is correct, you've got a problem. If all 20 paths are correct. You you've solved it. So, yeah, 
rambling. That's what I do. <laughs> well, I wanted to get to something completely different now, which uh, you did yes. mention briefly earlier on. Um, I wanted to talk about Dead Wire, which uh, I, I was curious if, like, where the concept for it came from and were there influences from, from other games uh, in particular? Because it's a little outside of Doom's usual uh, uh, qualities, I guess. You know, I I want to say yes, but I actually don't know what they are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 going to be subtle influences of some sort because the general kind of feel and creepiness, whatever. Um, I read a lot of like SCP, so SCP Foundation stuff. Oh yeah. And none of the Dead series or anything kind of spoopy or whatever is is influenced by any particular thing from SCP, but like the general vibe of it contributes a lot to the atmosphere i think um but beyond that i actually i i i'm saying i don't know if i if i grabbed any influence in particular but somebody somewhere is probably going to come out of nowhere and be like it's this and i'll be like fuck that's what it is <laughs> so i don't know but i imagine probably um i just remember having the idea of uh tv static and then you step into it and it's actually part of the world, and that was the concept. So, like the very beginning, where there's those those monitors that are static, and then you hit the switch, and it turns out that that those aren't monitors; those are a window to the outside, and the sky is static. Like that was sort of the that that particular scene at the very beginning was the mm. only real thing that I had plans, but I wanted to do that scene forever. That's cool. Yeah, like, I think it's yeah, interesting so whole... when stuff's driven by like one little aesthetic moment. Uh... I tend to do that with my maps and stuff where I will just have like a concept for this would look cool in Doom and then, you know, expand mm -hmm. from there. Yeah, so that was just, um, it started with that and everything else was just build a map using this layout around that concept and the other kind of, all the other parts just kind of fell into place organically, I think. Um, the, you know, and, you know, made some weapons because I like doing that and it's fun. Um, there wasn't really any sort of grand overarching plan aside from that scene mm -hmm. uh, everything else kind of was more like you know environmental storytelling getting the feel of it right um dead air was a lot more um i guess planned as it were like it was a lot a lot more intentional in its design dead wire was mostly just let's noodle around and see what happens <laughs> yeah dead air is interesting because it, it's still got kind of the the atmospheric qualities of the original but um it feels like a lot more action based and like yeah maybe there is like a bit more of a stricter story behind it was it a conscious decision to have it be more action based or uh, was this based on the weapon mod that's incorporated into it or, or what was the what was the general concept yeah so so dead dead air was it's exactly a playground for your weapons the uh the i guess if i wanted to say the mission statement of the wad it's a uh, good times with weapons that's it which actually kind of sort of runs counter to a lot of the feel of the wad because it starts off as kind of a slow, creepy thing, but then turns into something way different. And yeah. I know a few people prefer Dead Wire or like other wads because, yeah, there is kind of sort of a dissonance between the creepy atmosphere and then the action parts. But I guess I play a lot of games where like that's the case. Like Resident Evil starts out really creepy, and then by the end of it, you've got like a bazillion magnum rounds and you're destroying yeah. zombies left and right it's great like that ramp up is so fun to me mm -hmm. <laughs> that by the end of it you're just a walking gun toting killing machine even though at the beginning you were running from a single guy because all you have is a knife so there's a little bit of that in there but i think most of it was just um coming up with some fun weapons and then building interesting areas around them and that's that's basically all the wad really was is here's some interesting weapons and some cool arenas and let's kind of put it together and and come up with it like um the so 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 in that sense the the cornerstone of it was kind of almost like a more intentional zen dynamics like here's the weapons let's actually build maps around it instead of right. grab some scraps so if nothing else i'm kind of atoning for this end uh the uh <laughs> but yeah it was a lot of fun and uh i actually have a an update for dead dead air in the works that's just oh, cool. been kind of sitting here for a while because I'm so distracted by other projects. Because um, the final area was kind of rushed, and it's got some updates to that, some new sprites for the cyber demon replacements, mm -hmm. and a new weapon that that is only available on its second playthrough on a new game plus. Uh, and 
I still need to finish it. So there's actually like a 2.0 that I haven't released yet, funny enough. Mm -hmm. um, Pillow Blaster of uh, Roshan Overkill fame did some really cool sprites that I need to release because they're great. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> his stuff isn't, isn't public yet because I haven't done anything with it. <laughs> right. Um, Is there a lot of difficulty in like incorporating a weapon mod uh, into something like that? Or, or did you have the weapons in, in the background already and they were just sort of, the, the maps came secondarily? Um, I definitely made the weapons first before designing the levels around it, uh, in uh -huh. Dead Air's case. So, uh, I forget the exact order I did them in, like, I think I had most of the weapons finalized before I had really fleshed out the starting city area, but the whole thing, actually, funny enough, <laughs> putting the Zen Dynamics timeline on, I'm pretty sure it was, the whole thing was done in two weeks as well, because that was for the, uh, the, the Vine Sauce Drills, uh, first mapping contest. Oh, so, okay, yeah. It was a big whirlwind scramble of holy crap, try to get everything done. It was, it was actually too much. I bit off way more than I could chew with that. And so that was another sort of learning moment. And I'm never doing that again. <laughs> uh, no more crunching for Doom projects. What the fuck? But um, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, it, it, it was the, the, the areas were designed around the weapons for sure. Um, but in a much, I guess, you know, you know I, I, I knew a bit more of what I was doing than I did when I, made zen dynamics so same process but you know 10 plus years later with more experience kind of yeah uh it shows the the difference in experience <laughs> for sure thanks um um oh you go oh sorry you first you're well i was i was wanting to move into sort of the next the next thing so uh, if you had something more to add about about dead air then, then go for it yeah i think i'm just rambling as usual let me talk i'll just go forever <laughs> yeah i wanted to talk about um uh back to sat next two um and i was wondering you did sort of talk about vanilla and and uh and boom and, and things like that earlier but i was wondering as someone who tends to make things that are like pretty ambitious for doom i was wondering how you sort of dealt with the uh joys of things like this plane overflows and other restrictions for vanilla oh boy Vanilla mapping is masochism. It just there's there's no way around around that. <laughs> yeah. Um I I guess so so like I'm a programmer in my daily life and so mapping for vanilla is sort of like creative debugging and finding interesting ways around say performance limits. Like there's there's a lot of problem space overlap, or at least like how I think about things. And so sometimes when you run into cases where you've got limited number of planes, how the hell do I make this work? Um, it's an it's an interesting challenge to solve. That said, I'm actually like pretty burned out in vanilla nowadays. <laughs> like yeah. I don't think I would be doing any vanilla mapping at all if it wasn't for Back to Center Next episode three existing. <laughs> so yeah. That might be my last intentional hurrah into old school like vanilla viz plane stuff, just because I man, it's hard. It's it's really difficult, the stuff you have to do. Um it's I so the funny thing about it is the chronology of all my releases, like on Doom Wiki, is completely off from how like when they were actually made in in real life. Yeah, of course. Just because yeah, the project release dates are all over the place. And so one of the funnier things about Back to Saturn X is that like some of the some of the maps in there are like some of my much older maps. Like mm -hmm. ma map 26, uh beneath the festering moon, those towers was the very first thing that I did for uh Back to Saturn X. And I think it was my third vanilla map, like after my two Plutonia revisited things. Well, I guess uh -huh. that's not true because like Doom the way it did and stuff, I think, came in the middle. But somewhere in that weird haze that was Doom the way it did and Back to Saturn X and all that kind of stuff, um, that was one of the earliest vanilla things I put together. And so I really think that a lot of BTSX that has been released is me biting off way more than I can chew and then figuring out how to not choke to death. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so so it's it's really hard and... Um, but I, I've just done enough of it that, um, I have a lot of, there's a lot of things I know to do. Like there's, there's a lot of cool tricks you can do to save these planes that are really not obvious unless you do it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. 
So like one of the big biggest viz plane killers is if you have a bunch of concentric circles and they change light levels, then you've just destroyed your viz plane count. Right. Or or because it the the vanilla engine doesn't like slicing up a lot of stuff that is sort of concentric like that. You get so many splits and it increases your plane count like crazy. And this doesn't sound like a lot, but you'll see a whole lot of like maps have I don't know, an out there area and it'll have a fountain and the fountain will be like 16 units brighter, you know, just some circle. Well, what mm -hmm. you don't understand is vanilla still counts the sky as as viz planes pointlessly. It doesn't need to do this, but it does. And uh, so because you have a light difference in your fountain, the sky planes are getting split. And it turns out that when you have scenes like that, if you just make the light level the same as the surrounding areas, you might, like, get rid of, like, tens or, or like, 50 viz planes or something ridiculous. Wow. Like, yeah. there, there are things you can do and avoid that are very, very tiny, minuscule differences that make all the difference in the world. And I have some, like, I've done this so much that I've got this crazy-ass bag of tricks to try that there's been a lot of, you know... For TNT2 and other projects, I turned into sort of the Viz plane doctor. Like, <laughs> oh crap, we're hitting limits. Give it to Zazer, he'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So many TNT2 maps were just, I, I went in and figured out some weird shit and shuffled vertices around and added some blocking walls and stuff to stuff to do. But yeah, do you have a Viz plane uh, Bible somewhere that lists all of these? Uh, not yet. Hot tricks. It should That'd be good. Good resource. I, it it would, but the funny thing about it is I almost feel like the the target audience for the Visplane Bible is just all the people who I've worked with anyway. Like <laughs> the, the back to our next team. Okay, well, they know this because I learned it from them. Um yeah. I vanilla isn't dying as a concept. It's just more like I feel like most of the really heavy stuff is tends to be done by the same folks that probably know a lot of these tricks. Or or they're working with me on a project and they can just pass it to me instead. So right. I, I, think, I think that would be a very valuable resource five years ago. Uh, <laughs> so maybe someday, but I think it'd be fun to write these down just to sort of, if nothing else, trivia, like here are the things we had to deal with as like a post-mortem for Back to Saturn X would be yeah, fun. Yeah, that might and be cool, TNT, for sure. TNT2 has all sorts of crazy shit in it to make mm. it work. Um, but, you know, I say, I say that as if I'm some... Guru expert, uh, Tasman's Map Thirty for TNT Two is one of the most like jaw-droppingly amazing creations I've ever seen in any game, and it runs in vanilla, and that's all him. Like, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> so, so, so there's people who kick my ass on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, they so, can um, contribute to the Visplane Bible. There you go. Yeah, we should all all Multiple connect this together. Yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> If we ever made a Vizplane Bible, then I'm pretty sure that it would start with an intro section that's like, so the first thing you should consider is solving this problem by just not doing it. Yeah, <laughs> map and boom. <laughs> it's... Map and boom, seriously. It's, vanilla is fun, but you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. And you don't see it a whole lot these days, but every once in a while you would see somebody who would suggest, you know, start with vanilla and then go up. But Nah, you you don't yeah. want to do that. If you're a new no, mapper, start with boom, like full stop. Or maybe as someone line, who did most of the early mapping in vanilla, I can't tell you the joy I felt when I discovered uh like extended formats that, that got rid of his plane limits and, and sector yeah. limits and stuff. As someone who made like yeah. really big maps that used to just like crash <laughs> when they tried to save and God it, it was a nightmare back then. Yeah, that's one of the things that's so crazy is I don't know how people back in the 90s did it because they didn't have Chaco render limits or Visplane Explorer or any of no. these Bible tricks. They just had, huh, sometimes the map crashes when I look at it funny. <laughs> yeah. So how, how the hell do you, do you work like that? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but what's funny about it is that the, the actual answer to that is, um, well, some, some legendary vanilla map sets actually do have VPOs in certain spots. Like, they, they shipped with it. That's the answer. Uh, yeah. the, uh, it, it wasn't really possible to make it perfect because they didn't have the tools available to report on all the stuff. So um, there's lots of places in, like, Plutonia 2, for example, 
that will just overflow the shit out of things. Like you look at the wrong place in map 29 and you just get hom all over because seg overflows. And that just happens because they didn't have the tools. Mm-hmm. So, so what's funny is, um, this is getting a little off topic, so I won't go too far into this is, um, people love to rant about games, you know, gamers just get angry about stuff. Cause that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and one of the weirder ones that you see nowadays is people talk about patches for games. Like they're a bad thing. Like, Oh, they released day one patch. So they could have fixed all their bugs or whatever. Right. Um, but the, this is actually a good thing because what that means is when people inevitably do find stuff, they can fix it. Um, do you know what happened back in the day when they shipped a game on a disc? They just shipped the bugs and they were always buggy. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, TNT famously, right, with the uh, the yellow key and yeah, 31. There's a there's an uncompletable map in in, in an IWAD. Like <laughs> yeah. and and most versions of the game, well, I don't know what it is nowadays. I think I think it's actually fixed now, thank God. And the, well, they patched the it, port. funnily enough. Yeah, but for decades, it was not patched. And so you would buy the game and play it, and you couldn't beat a level. Like, like the whole idea of not being able to complete a level in a game would destroy, like, most people's brains who play games nowadays because mm-hmm. that stuff gets patched out. Like, it's a rare, like... It's a notable occurrence when something is so buggy that you have that kind of stuff in it. Um, but the new thing isn't that games are buggy. The new thing is that they are getting fixed. And so there's a similar kind of concept when it comes to vanilla and viz planes and stuff. And yeah, back to Saturn X and stuff are like their entire point is to push the limits to their limit. Huh? So of course they're going to run into these things and have to fix these things a lot more than average vanilla set X. But technically speaking, when you ask the question, well, how did the old people solve all these problems? The answer sometimes is, well, they didn't always. They sometimes just shipped it because they didn't have the tools available. And that's just the way it is. So nowadays, though, you don't have to worry about it because you can just run it in PR Boom and, or DSD Doom and you're, you're good. <laughs> it's no problem. Yeah, exactly. It's the um, same PR Boom. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I don't know. The album is pretty stable. I just, I haven't opened it in, like, a year. And I'm like, why am I saying the wrong name of the port? Oh, right, Zoe. right, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we're jumping around again because I have to because you've done just so many things. Um, <laughs> I wanted to jump to Sharp Things, which uh, it was a map made for something called Battle of the Bits, which I was wondering if you could explain what that was uh, for those who aren't informed. Uh, yes. So Battle of the Bits basically is a chiptune competition website, which is completely out of left field. What does that have to do with Doom? Right. Uh, <laughs> so it's a it's a really cool thing. If you're into tracker modules or chiptunes or anything like that, battleofthebits.org is this amazing repository of like a bazillion absurdly talented musicians who just make stuff for fun and submit things for competitions. And uh, so if you like that kind of stuff, check them out. They're, it's great. Um, but so their, their whole format is they will just every once in a while have a competition where you can submit stuff and vote for things and whatnot. And there's like a system on the site that lets you do that. And uh, they uh, very rarely will have one for doom mapping. And so Sharp Things was just this somebody randomly was like, hey, this random website's doing a doom compo. Do you want to submit something? I'm like, sure, why not? And mm-hmm. so that was fun because um, I don't. I forget if Sharp Things was my first one I submitted or if it was a different... Either way, that started with me making a Doom map for one of these things, and it turned into me like getting back into making music and writing modules, and so that like cured my musician's block. It was really cool. Mm. I, I do that, too. It's, a, it's irrelevant, I guess. Um, but the uh, Sharp Things kind of was this fun challenge because I had been wrapped up in so many community projects and team projects for a while that I hadn't released anything standalone for a while. So I was just sort of like, what would a single map be? Like, how does that work? What do I do here? <laughs> right. um, so I don't know if there was a whole lot of like stuff for sharp things aside from let's just make some interesting fun stuff. But um, the I guess the twist of sorts was that it was a Doom 1 compo, so you couldn't use any Doom 2 stuff. So I kind of reached into the no end in sight bag of tricks and made the made the 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 real enemy is the map itself and the progression and the strange traps and all the other kind of business. So mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but but um, yeah, it's it started on a chiptune competition website because yeah. they just randomly have Doom stuff very rarely. 
<laughs> but I it guess, happens. Yeah, seeing that, I was wondering if you thought there would be um, so, like a, a benefit to the Doom community doing things like, uh, you know, mapping contests, speedrunning contests, things of that nature, maybe uh, a bit more of that. We've had stuff like the Vine Source thing you mentioned earlier, but definitely seems a bit rarer uh, than just straight up community projects. The closest that I've seen is like speed mapping because um so so the the really cool thing that Battle of the Bits and a lot of other kind of similar websites do is they do one hour competitions where they will basically announce a start time and they'll give you like a theme or like a set of samples or just something or format or something you have to make. But they they basically don't release the rules until an hour before it's due. So you have an hour to make an entire thing from scratch go. And that's the similar concept of speed mapping. Um, but what's really cool about Battle of the Bits is that it's not just make a thing for fun. They actually, like, I know this is like, some people like this, some people don't, but they, they have like, it's a competition. They have a ratings thing. You, you like people yeah. get crowned winners and stuff. So there's kind of this interesting sort of competitive but friendly aspect to it where everyone's just kind of making a thing for fun. Um, there's no prizes beyond some imaginary internet points, but... Something about that whole concept, at least, got the creative juices really, really flowing, not just for sharp things, but for, for music as well. So that's the thing you don't see in speed mapping in Doom, or at least I haven't seen it, is like you, you sort of rarely see these sort of competition sort of things, but you don't see them mixed with, you know, a short term speed mapping thing. They're always very long, drawn out affairs, like right. we're going to do this for two months and that's what you get kind of deal. So... So I feel like that could work um, is some kind of smaller, more focused, like speed mapping with rank, with competition-y things. Um, but one of the other reasons that Battle of the Bits works so well is their website has like stuff for that. Like you have points in your accounts and there's a voting system built into the site and all that. Yeah, so, right. so yeah, so it's all, it's all kind of like integrated as part of the experience as opposed to like somebody on a forum needing to like manage all that themselves. So that would be the big challenge, I think, about translating that to Doom. If you wanted to do it on Doom World, or if you want, you could host the battle on Battle of the Bits because they have all that. So the funny thing is, is like, maybe it's a crossover project, like F it, get, get some Doom people to be like, hey, we're gonna use this website to do things because they have a format and they're gonna let us do it. Yeah, maybe. Just reach out the, yeah, I can reach out the admin and be like, hey, we have this weird idea, you wanna do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it could work. Yeah, I I definitely think uh as I mean we have community projects and stuff but um I think it can be good to have things that maybe maybe put a little more pressure on people sometimes to to really get stuff done, you know. Yeah, yeah, the um it's it's a really cool balance somehow because the downside about having any sort of competitive stuff is well, hey, people get really competitive, I guess. But yeah. um if there's too much pressure, it starts getting not great. Like, uh, it starts getting stressful. And somehow they just hit this very cool sweet spot where everybody involved just kind of knows it's for fun. It's it's no hard feelings if you don't get first or whatever. It you know it's really 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 rare that anybody ever gets like bent out of shape or something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is just the site culture. Like it's been around for a while, and the founders were just fun, chill people. And so there's this long-standing, just everybody on the site is just fun and chill kind of deal. So that I think would be a big thing. Is to me why why that site's magic works the way it does is the culture on top of the actual mechanics of it. And so you know, if we want to do something like that in Doom, that would be something to really focus on is to make sure that it's known that hey, we're in this for fun. It's cool. There's no like, yes, there's sort of a ranking thing on it, but there's, I wouldn't want there to be like cash prizes or really harsh blah, 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 or we're going to write your name in the CAC awards every time you win or something kind of weirdness. It's more yeah, like right. we're, we're straight up doing this for fun. There's some points as an incentive, but the main number one goal is just to give you enough of a nudge that you want to make it. And then there you go. Yeah, exactly. So... So I don't know. They, for for me at least, they hit this really cool sweet spot, and you know they're not the only site that does that. If you search for one hour compo like that, there's lots of places that do this kind of stuff with music. Um, I think realistically, to for maps, one hour is really short. Two is a bit better. Three is probably a better spot. Um, but that's also something that like you know speed mapping sessions are a thing. They've been hosted for a while, so 
you it there's there's not really a lot there that needs to be reinvented it's just more like hey how do we join these two worlds together yeah so. for sure um, that said oh. i love these ideas but i'm also i've also hit that point in my life where i'm running out of free time to start hosting this stuff so Someone i love this idea <laughs> yeah somebody else who's not me has to pick it up like i <laughs> i i can't be the guy driving that forward although i would love to participate if somebody kicks off a series like that so here's an idea for the taking yeah, <laughs> feel free to yoink it, could it. Be fun. Mm-hmm. uh so i'm trying to segue this neatly but i don't have a neat segue really Col- collaboration uh eve eternity <laughs> i wanted to talk about your map uh, map 26 for that uh visually oh. um just a really like a master class really in in like creating what feels like a real sense of space um in doom like the fake 3d with the with the boom bridge uh the use of mid textures around and stuff uh there's a huge amount of hide variation which uh really adds to like the way movement feels in the map i'm curious if there was like a lot of planning for making that map or whether it like is your general style to just uh, build things and and let the mapping happen. Um, I it it depends on the map. Sometimes I'll sketch stuff. Sometimes I want. Sometimes it's just organic crazy. Um, but yeah, Transcendent of Eternity Twenty Six was one of the cases where I sketched it on paper first before uh, putting any lines down. Right. Um. The the two towers was the the kind of core visual concept of the map was this this whole image of. You've got a, a heavenly halo tower and then this completely out of place hell tower literally jutting up through the landscape where it doesn't belong. Um, so so that was the starting point was, okay, we got these two towers and a whole lot of the way the maps flowed vertically was kind of, uh, you know, A, balancing aesthetics and or balancing like progression and, and will this actually be a neat combat area? But on top of that, it was, okay, where can I place the player that they can get a good view of these towers and from different angles and stuff? So like a lot of the, the like how you start and kind of descend downwards, um, one of the reasons you start on kind of like an elevated platform is so you get that immediate first visual of the whole area before you go down into it. Um, it was this, it was, uh, if you've played uh, Dark Souls 3, the Ring City DLC, it have, was, yeah, yeah it's, it's basically that when you first get dropped down to the ring city and you see the whole thing from up above that was the sort of like feel i was going for with that was you can see almost the entire play space from your starting point and you kind of have to go down and descend into it and figure out how to navigate it was the idea um because what's neat about it is it's a i've always been interested in the concept of like you present something to somebody with the with the knowledge that they won't be able to absorb all of it like this is going to get weird and abstract, but you know, sometimes you see like you rewatch a movie and you see some kind of thing where you're like, Oh my gosh, that's foreshadowing. I never noticed. And I love that kind of stuff because sometimes you can put stuff in plain sight and you know, the viewer or reader or player will not know what that is until later. And so there's a similar thing in level design where you can literally put the entire play space in front of the player, but because there's so much of it, there's no way they can just look down and be like, okay, I, I know the path through the maze hell you know yeah. mazes in general are that you can te- technically see the entire maze from the top but you don't know what the solution is you have to figure out how to piece it apart and so that sort of opening scene where you show the player everything that they're about to get into before they descend into it is just really cool to me for some reason like i i just like that in media in general so that was that and most of the rest of it kind of sort of was okay i got these two things how do you progress blah 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 where are the switches that used to drop the tower and sketch it out on paper before i made it um Mm -hmm. the starting area was very different than how i originally planned it but in a good way i have an old outtake where i had some kind of weird terraced garden thing with a lot of stairs that you descended from the start but it was way too complicated and greebly like it was it was a mess, and so I scrapped it and recreated it. But most mm-hmm. of the rest of the map kind of kind of flowed together. Uh, so that's sort of the, the the upfront kind of things that the map is doing. Um, there's also an entire second uh, like meta story to the map, I guess, because it's a tribute to a friend of mine who passed away, and there's a lot of like symbolism in the map that like probably nobody but me sees and 
maybe someday I'll share that kind of stuff. And here's what this thing means in the map. But I always feel a little weird about sharing stuff like that because um, A, it's very personal. And B, it feels too much like I'm trying to tell people what things mean and what, like, here's how you're supposed to feel about this area. And I don't know, I don't like doing that kind of stuff as an author. So there's a, there's actually a lot of very, like, intentional hidden details to the point where I think this is probably the most thought I've put into a single map. Like, I think, I think ever. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of those details, I think, are just things that are locked in my head because it doesn't make sense to share them, if, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, there it, are some like very subtle, very personal things like in Fractured Worlds too that I, I mean, I will probably never mm -hmm. tell people what <laughs> that they're there or, or what they mean, but you know, there, there's some yeah. stuff too. Uh, so I'll, yeah, it's and that's it's one of the neat things about it to me is, um, it's always tempting, I guess, as kind of an author of a work to like share that kind of thing because I mean, hey, that's what art's for, right? But I also never want to be that preachy guy, like, it's good to put those kinds of things in there because you get it out there, but um, I guess for me, I've never really felt a need to explain everything, <laughs> like. If somebody picks it up, great. If they don't, yeah. it's fine. I still got it out of, out of my system, if that makes sense. I think, the, um, yeah, I don't know. I think with stuff like that, for me, it was more about marking a point in time and um, just, it was a big, important project for me. Like, it, it took up a lot of my time and a lot of my creative energy. And uh, I don't know, it felt like the two things were kind of intertwined. So I, I mm -hmm. put it in just for me, and I, I have absolutely no inclination of, like, <laughs> wanting other people to know about it, I guess. There you go. Yeah, it's not just me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's a it's a death of the author thing. Like, if I, if I want to share something, then I explicitly want to put it in the work. Otherwise, if somebody wants to draw the conclusion, cool, but, you know, you always got to be, you know, careful to make sure you don't suggest the, the wrong thing. Um, but uh, beyond that, it's... I guess to me, I've just never found it necessary to like completely write down. Here's like everything that goes into this, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Like I've got a whole story in my head of what's going on in Dead Wire and Dead Air, but right now it's not really relevant because I have yet to actually put that story in the wad or mm -hmm. in a in a sequel or any anything like that. So, so maybe someday I'll tell that, or maybe not. And if I if I don't get around to it, then it doesn't really matter because the I think I hope the work stands fine on its own it doesn't need that additional context i guess mm -hmm. um i think it's straying a little off topic because i ramble <laughs> but um there's a tendency from a lot of like writers and people who do sort of like writing adjacent creative works to try to lore dump every single detail about their their universe and that's just i don't know tiresome to me and a lot of those details like it's good to flesh them out for your own sake so you make your stuff consistent but um how many people do you think have actually read the Silmarillion? <laughs> and that's like one of the most seven. notable examples of a, of a, what's up? I said seven people. There you go, exactly seven. There you go. <laughs> um, but like, and that's one of the more no no notable works that's effectively a lore dump from a legendary author. And yet for the casual reader, it's completely impenetrable. So yeah. it's not impossible to, you know, I guess execute it better if that makes sense. but. Um, you don't need to read it to appreciate Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or anything like that. So I, I kind of use that as my touchstone, and it's weird to compare myself to Tolkien or anybody who's great. Cause who the fuck am I? I'm just some guy who's making maps, whatever. But if I'm gonna if I'm gonna pretend to wear an artist hat, I want to at least like you know think, okay, if I was an artist, how would I approach this? And so for things like that, I just um, I don't want to get too hoity toity about it. I've already done that before, and <laughs> I'm embarrassed about it. Lost episode, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow, it was a real, a, yeah, a painful memory. Clearly, I guess it's it's just weird. It's 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 the meta around it, not necessarily the product. But um, mm -hmm. oh well, <laughs> we all get scarred for silly reasons, right? <laughs> well, um, that is true. Uh, you wake up in the middle of the night, like, oh, I shouldn't have changed that Jaguar map. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> what did I do? Why yeah. did these weird circle textures everywhere why are there why is there swiss cheese in the walls yeah. um well don't let it get to you too much I, I think you're probably thinking about it more than the people who uh left a one-side game review and then 
and then ran away <laughs> into the shadows. Oh, again. certainly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's what we do. <laughs> so, as, as someone who's been in the community for uh, twenty years now, um, how do you think it's sort of changed over the years? Is there anything you can note that's like markedly different, uh, apart from you know, obviously new ports and and things like that? Um. Yeah, there's. Ah, oh gosh, it's hard to point at one thing because there's been a lot of like ebb and flows and tide changes and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, in general, like a you know, I mostly hang out in Doom World nowadays, but like it's 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 a much friendlier place than it was back in the day. Um, right. One of the things I always thought was interesting, just looking back, because it's kind of this, I don't know, case study in social dynamics or what I don't know, <laughs> sociologists if they're really bored could get something out of this is um. If you go back to like the 2010s, like late 2000s, early 2010s, Doom World was kind of like a really kind of rough place. Like people weren't like necessarily super assholes if you're posting your work, but there were definitely places where there were just idiots running around and they would be jerks and then they people would shout them down and they would kind of shut up and there you go. And uh, it was sort of this weird concept where a lot of us myself included had the idea that oh doom world's self-moderating you know people people if they act up somebody will shout them down and the project product solves itself the trouble with it though is um you still have the initial person being a jerk and there were some people that were just like repeat that over and over again it was just a known thing you never posted and everything else it was terrible it still sucks a little bit now but it's a lot better mm -hmm. and but but in the back of my head i was always like that's fine. There's, there's no problem with it. It solves itself. If somebody was actually a problem, they, they would get taken out. And so there were definitely some notable community incidents that a lot of it was just people got, you know, not banned for the longest time. They just, you know, we'd have, everybody would have to put up with their ass over and over and over again. And then, you know, towards the end of the decade, uh, Linguisa came back and everybody started cleaning house at some point. And what do you know? Doom World actually got better. <laughs> How funny is that? <laughs> right. uh, so, I mean, yeah, that sort of like splintered and Doomer boards, whatever, but like, yeah, who cares? Um, but but it's funny because it sort of challenges the idea of, oh, the community polices itself, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it, it's it's definitely gotten more chill nowadays just as a whole. But the um, I think the things that stick, it, um, stick out in my head the most, and this might come across as weird to people who aren't me, is mm -hmm. that sometimes you run into situations where things don't change, and sometimes that's a good thing. And I need to explain myself here because it's probably just weird if 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 you're not in my headspace. Is I have been around long enough to see so many community blowups, like bad blood between people and drama and you know a lot of times where there's stuff where somebody will do something bad and you know get shouted down and it turns into a big thing sometimes it's serious sometimes it's stupid sometimes it's not and in spite of like every single time that's happened the doom community has still stayed this kick-ass awesome place so like even the most serious blow-ups have still not torn it apart if that makes sense so it's resilient. Um, there are definitely some things that I'm like, well, that shouldn't have happened and it was not handled well. And there's, you know, bad blood that I don't think, you know, you, you can't unburn every bridge if that makes sense. But there's been a lot of cases, you know, in both recent and old history where something will happen and people will be like, ah, crap, the X is ruined forever. And then my, my the back of my head is always just like, okay, just wait five years and everybody will we'll have moved on. We'll have figured out how to move past this because it's happened every time. Um, so it's a little weird and abstract when I say it this way, and I'm not trying to say it to like excuse any sort of like whatever blah incident that may or may not have occurred. It's just it's just a thing where like I've seen so many things like TNT2 fucking exploded and still is very nearly released now. Like right. if we can recover from that, then there's we can recover from a lot of things. And I think the things that would be most dangerous of actually tearing the Doom community apart and making it a toxic place, people are taking care of that shit when it happens. So the stuff that could actually be legit really bad, people don't let that happen. Like, like the 
anyhow, I, I don't want to dive too much into specifics if that makes sense, but yeah. there's just, there's just been a couple of things recently where like there's been some some butting of heads over things that yeah, it totally makes sense that y'all butted heads over this and you know makes sense people are angry about this that really sucks, but. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't cause the big schisms necessarily that it used to, perhaps. Right. It's it's. I know we'll move on from it because we have every other time. I don't know what that means in every single instance, um, but it it's happened so many times before, and there's been bigger blowups that have been recovered from that. I guess when these kinds of things happen, a lot of times I just don't really speak a lot on them, but that's because of the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, we'll move on from this. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, I find myself in that weird role where I'm like, oh, crap, I didn't get involved. What can I do to help repair the, the schism, I guess? TNT2. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's a thing where, yes, there's a lot of change in the community, but the important kind of things um, stick around, if that makes sense. People are still excited about making the game. Yeah. Like, boom mapping hasn't gone away. It's, it's evolved. Yeah. PR boom hasn't gone away. There's a new port that's taken the torch on. And so it, I guess it's like when people talk about change, they're worried about losing stuff. Like, oh gosh, this thing is, doesn't exist anymore. And I guess it's just more like the good shit still seems to keep rolling and the bad shit seems to get stomped out. And if there's troubles, then we figure out how to solve it and move on and fix it. And that's kind of that, that machine has been churning pretty steadily, pretty well for the last couple of decades now and i guess there's a general upward trend and that is amazingly refreshing um that there's an online community that's like that in the modern era of everything on the internet being a shit show so <laughs> right. um yeah so I don't, I don't mean to say that everything in the new community is like you know rainbows and roses all the time and uh i don't want to be any sort of like oh well you know count chickens or whatever it's like count yourself lucky kind of bullshit there's problems and they, they happen and we got to solve them and that's that that's normal we should do that but it's good to know that uh i guess i've been around long enough that i don't have some sort of like despair that the whole place is going to fall apart or that it's at risk yeah, of right. doing so so yeah it's a again a very long-winded rambly answer to a very simple <laughs> question you asked but i think that that's, that's those are the really parts fun. that stick out to me it's it's how it's i don't know the doom community seems to repair itself pretty damn nicely when shit does go wrong yeah <laughs> so that's nice i like that mm -hmm. i you also i mean we did sort of there were mentions of ports and things throughout that and i, I mean i did eventually want to get to this uh you did some work helping uh with mbf 21 i was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that port and the benefits of it and what's interesting about it and stuff because uh like i said before i've been working with it a bit and uh, really enjoying like the unique stuff you can do with it so curious uh as to your thoughts um yeah the uh it, it kind of was sort of a practical thing because gz doom has existed for a long ass time now and so technically speaking the sky's the limit with that the amount of things that you can do with the game with z script nowadays are just insane but despite that there has always, always, always still been this classic audience of people who don't want to use those features. Um, and demo compatibility is a gigantic reason why. Like, you know, speedrunners, you know, they, they're not going to use GZ Doom. It doesn't do what they need. And so just for practical concern, because there has always been such a large audience for the non-Z Doom half of the community, there were certain places that just always felt like they were stuck in the Stone Age. Um, the bigger one than even any of the stuff MBF21 added to me was the lack of any sort of map info. Like UMAP info is fucking amazing. Like to me, that's more important right, yeah. than MBF21 is because just, you know, sure the 32 map megawatt is kind of a tradition nowadays, but God damn, is it a cliche seeing every single secret exit on maps 15 and 31 and there's nothing different. Yeah, like, what yeah. the hell? <laughs> Why is everybody making exactly 32 maps? Why is... So... Because it has been so pervasive, like both that and just various random limitations and boom and just limits you hit with dehacked, like it just felt like because there's such a gigantic jump between that to GZ Doom, and there's a lot of people who don't want to leave certain things behind from kind of the PR boom sphere, like uh, you know, demos being a large one, it just always felt like there was this this um missing piece of 
let's pluck the low-hanging fruit and improve Boom. Like, basically, we needed a Boom 2.0 update, but because it was sort of a dead standard for a while, there was no such thing. PR Boom, you know, hadn't had any major development for a long ass time. And there was a fork for you map info that was sort of like not really taking off whatever. Mm -hmm. And then DSDA Doom happens. And suddenly, holy fucking shit, we've got a new PR Boom successor. It's under active de development. People are using it. It has you map info. That just opened like a gigantic world. Yeah. So basically this, this whole problem of, oh crap, we've got this dead standard that can't be edited but people don't want to make the leap to GZ Doom. Suddenly, the gear started turning, and it was like, "Well, fuck! Can we do something about this?" And uh, I, I certainly can't take credit for the idea because again, Craft Lab just kind of started doing stuff with DSDA Doom, and it took off. And uh, other people besides me had the idea of, what, "Could we just do a new Boom standard?" Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't even come up with the idea of the dehacked. Um, me and some other folks were just kind of grumbling a bit because I was doing some some work for you know a work in progress thing and was just really annoyed because D hacked even with MBF was missing some stuff and some folks got to talk and was like, okay, well what what would we add if we could add some more things? And it just kind of spiraled upward from there and MBF 21 happens. So so the uh the real sort of like key to the puzzle there was this suddenly this this because the what the 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 whole boom the primary boom port everybody uses in maintenance mode, there was no chance of a new standard feature happening. Once that changed, once it's like, oh crap, we can actually maybe make some changes. When let's talk with the guy who's developing the source port. He likes the idea. Let's do some shit. It just kind of snowballed from there and turned into, hey, can we make this thing everybody uses better? Because um, yeah, yes, GZDM's great, but there is a set of people that it just wants ever appeal to. And mm -hmm. okay, what can we do to make it to where those people have some more flexibility? And what can we do to alleviate these major pain points that have stuck around in the old format for ages? Like there are so many subtle tweaks that I guess people who aren't power players may not recognize. Um All map like, is, uh for for instance, um there was talk before MBF twenty one happened and, and DSDA kind of became as big as it was and like the actual port people were gonna use. Rubix actually had his own he compiled his own version of Boom that fixed uh because there was a lot of talk between us. Uh, a few of us, like uh Ben Dribbemu, Zol, me, Rubix and stuff, and we we were talking about uh trying to fix the slight problems with Boom, like the friction not working correctly and the music changing not working correctly and, and so Rubik's put together this version that fixed those errors and <laughs> we needed like a really good compiler uh to if we wanted it to become like a proper standard port so there was talk of like oh maybe we should get some money together and we'll we'll buy like a really good compiler for it and stuff and I actually put it together and then you know dsda and, and mbf21 happened so Oh geez, I, I didn't even know you were working on that. Now I feel bad. It sniped your ideas. Shit. Well, no, I mean, I don't think any of us were uh, super chuffed to the idea of putting money towards this compiler, but... Um, yeah. There you go. It was, Somebody else did all the dirty work for you. Exactly. <laughs> it was very fortuitous for us, I think, who who had a few gripes with Boom not being updated, and, and so, yeah, those small changes were, were really great to see happen. Well, um, but yeah, either way, it's... It, I'm I'm glad people are liking it, but it was a, uh, it was kind of sort of a culmination of years and years and years of what felt like unaddressable complaints, basically, because yeah. your options were either stick with it or make the leap to a more advanced source part, which you know, you know, GZ is an option, Eternity is an option, um, there, but it it's it the options were either you have to completely there was no perfect solution, I guess, because I love Eternity, awesome port. It's really niche. Even when Heartland came out, it was really hard to convince a lot of people to actually download the port to even try the WAD. Um, so, so I always wanted it to kind of sort of be the big boom savior, but it didn't quite take off. And then DSDA Doom did. And so that ended up kind of sort of being the one that, that let us do all these ideas, if that makes sense. It's, again, a practical concern of it was the one that everybody chose, so let's put some stuff in it. <laughs> yeah. um, and what are the sort of limitations you were looking for to try and keep it feeling like boom because i know more and more stuff is getting added like i think uh jump compatibility is getting added um 
decorate is being incorporated, which is really good, by the way, for anyone who's sort of slogged through using like uh, wax and stuff for dehacks and things <laughs> like that. But yeah, I wonder if there's like, is it just, do you think it would be okay if this port became, you can use everything or this format rather, like you can use everything you can in UDMF, but the game feels like boom. I guess I'm sort of skeptical that it can really reach that stage, if that makes sense, because um, there are some, I think there are some things that can be done, um, like a, a boom UDMF type and things like that. But um, the the hard part for me, and this is, this is just me and my personal opinions, is that if you start getting a little bit too far along, then all you're doing is retreading GZ Doom's territory. Exactly. If you can do, yeah, if you can do that while maintaining demo compatibility, then then you may have something there. But the thing that's difficult is, or I guess there are a few things that I think we missed in MBF21, like looking back like crap, like there's no genericized paint elements or arch file pointers. There's a lot of like little things which we didn't think about at the time, which would have been great to have. Mm -hmm. But it really was kind of like an exercise and let's pluck a bunch of, let's let's pluck all the low hanging fruit we can find. Like what can we what can we offer to customize that makes sense in a boomscape that doesn't start reaching too far into this is just GZ Doom with extra steps territory. And I guess I, I think there's a room, there's definitely room for it to grow, but I just it's hard for me to get ex I, I'm bah humbing. I feel silly because I'm bah humbugging something I kind of like had a part in. But if you start going too far, then it starts just being like, here's GZ Doom, but you're using like 15 year old tech, which is kind of not that exciting to me. Cause it, like even decorate, right? Um modern GZ Doom modding with Z script is like light years ahead of old school decorate stuff. Like the kinds yeah. of things you can do with it, like creating your own functions and overriding virtuals, change change behavior, event handlers. There's all sorts of cool shit you can do in GZ Doom modding nowadays that is so far removed from what could conceivably be done in like a decorate boom port that like i guess it's sort of like you start hitting a point where you're getting close enough that you can see a cool thing that you want to do but you're not actually close enough to make it happen because i have spent so long like i grew up in z doom land and you know in the zen dynamics days i spent so long sort of like throwing myself against the limits of the port um trying to push it further than it wanted to go that nowadays when it's finally like cool the sky's the limit with gz doom i just don't really have a lot of desire to go back to those days of damn it i can almost do a thing now i have to figure out ha how to hack it to make it work if that makes sense <laughs> so yeah right it's it's a very strange answer and i i do believe there are some really good things that can be done uh with like cool new dsda stuff it's just um i just don't know if uh if if I just don't know what they are, if that makes sense, because um, I kind of sort of exhausted most of the stuff in my head for MBF21, and aside from a handful of things, um, I guess I'm just thinking, like, the cool stuff is stuff that I haven't thought of, and and I don't know what they are. And maybe the idea of a demo-compatible GZ Doom Lite is what everybody wants, and if that's the case, do it, kick ass. Um, it's just, I guess, if this... Again, I'm rambling, but most of the things we ended up doing with MBF21, with a few handful of exceptions, like it checked off most of the boxes on my personal list that I'm kind of satisfied with where it's at. Yeah. To the point where I think there's cool new stuff that's going to be done by other people. And I just don't guess I'm going to be involved in it, if that makes sense. That may change, but at the moment, uh -huh. um, I absolutely don't want to bah humbug uh, anybody's efforts going forward. So when I say things like, I don't know what's next, that's me not saying I don't think there's anything that could be done. It's just I don't necessarily know if there's anything that I'm looking forward to, but that's a literal meaning of I just don't know what's next. Yeah. Um, I guess it was... Oh, sorry. Did you have more to say? No, I, I just... Sorry if that... I think I... I don't know if I really answered your question. I sort of like... No, I think you covered sort of, yeah, what I was asking about, for sure. Um... I was curious with Vespa, uh, what the difference felt like working uh, with MBF um, versus um, regular Boom, making weapon mods for, for like a Boom format mod. Um, I'll tell you what, the, 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 the real game changer for 
Oh man, there's a lot of game changers there. Um, so anybody who has messed with old school D hacked or whacked or any sort of you know traditional D hacked editor and hasn't tried Deco Hack or DH nine thousand if you're wanting to do a vanilla thing, try it. Yeah, try it. Is, it. <laughs> it is a, a lifesaver. It is a game changer. You don't know what you're missing until you try it. Like I agree. The, just the concept of not having to worry about so. Even your most restrained vanilla projects will eventually run into what I call state fragmentation, where you're like, cool, I have, uh, I just used eight frames for my imp's walk state, and oh shit, I need to add two more somewhere. You, well, in old school dehack, you can't just like add two things in the middle, you have to borrow two things from some other state. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do that again 20,000 times, and then you've got this Batman Doom DEH nightmare state table that you can't make any damn sense of. And, uh, Deco hacks entire thing is you write something in something that looks like decorate so it's a common format everybody knows and it will figure out all that shit for you it will just figure out where in the state table it goes and even if you were not wanting to use any new features or any boom or whatever then this method of doing dehacked is like infinitely better like i cannot stress enough if you haven't tried this please give it a try like Knee Deep in Knee Deep in Z Doom, which just came out, uses DEH nine thousand, which is Fraggle's version of it. And Essel, like, I don't I don't know if she's like gone on record publicly talking about it, but that was one of the things that sort of revived the project was switching the old ass D hacked lump that was a giant mess over to DEH nine thousand suddenly opened up a bazillion doors just because it was possible to work without scrambling your brain into eggs. It's the difference between using Doom Builder like ultimate doom builder versus like using deu like sure you can probably make a good map in deu nowadays but <laughs> it's the the way in which you interact with the editor is so freaking primitive that the gap between that and what you can do with like modern dehack tools is night and day so that's that's thing one is the 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 whole concept of you're writing the states and it's creating the dehack for you like compiling it quote unquote like that's a game changer by itself so that's the cool thing number one that makes dehack modding feel a whole lot more friendly and kind of gz to me and the second thing is just um the the additional args that mbf21 lets you play with now all of a sudden you can do you have so much flexibility with weapon and monster behaviors like fuck you have a projectile shotgun now you can have damage over time you can have all sorts of cool things that basically you couldn't really do like here is, I think, the most basic, most important single dehack feature in MBF21. Like, if I could only, if I could only make one thing exist, and the rest of it had to be sacrificed, it actually would be the custom monster projectile function, because right, yeah. it's gonna you be can't, sure. yeah, you can't do that in Boom. There's no way to make a monster throw anything that's not one of the default Doom projectiles, and there's not a lot of them. So it's like, fuck. I, you, and you can't even replace the rocket without messing with the player. So that was the number one frustration that, to me, eventually led to MBF21 being made. Like, that was the thing that started making me ask questions and started the discussion. Or This is what started me talking with other people about it, was I, I had a new monster, and I wanted to make it do a new attack. And I'm like, there's no code pointer for this. Like, there's nothing. MBF doesn't even <laughs> have this. Like, there's a... I feel bad because... Hindsight 2020, right? And there's we're all kind of standing on the shoulders of giants, but a lot of times I kind of shake my fist in the air against like Lee Kilo and and the old Boom developers and all those folks because there's a lot of features like an MBF in particular where you're just sort of like, I see what you're going for here, but you didn't really think things through. Right. So like they have a a a custom actor spawn function that lets you spawn an enemy. An MBF, like original MBF for back in the day. Oh. But they didn't think to add one for projectiles, which is the number one thing you're gonna want to do if you mod monsters. It's like, why would you not think of that? Like that's right, weird yeah. to me. Like it it's basically a case of it feels more like a programmer was adding stuff that seemed like it made sense to them, but they never really touched base with any mappers or modders and asked, what do you guys need? So it it feels like there's a lot of boom specials and things that just don't make sense the way they're implemented. Like um, one of the things MBF21 adds to maps is scrolling line def specials. 
that fucking work. <laughs> because uh, the way Boom's custom scroll direction functions work means if you try to apply them to lines that aren't the exact same angle as your control line def, they scroll differently. And it's like, yeah. but, but if I have a waterfall that's not just a straight line, it doesn't work. And it's like, <laughs> did, you, did you play test your feature? Like, it doesn't make sense why you did it like this. So some of the stuff in MBF 21 was just closing those, what I like to consider common sense gaps. Um, but uh, so, so working with all those features to make Vesper was, it didn't feel like making a boom or dehack project at all. Like it feels more like making something for Eternity or GZ Doom. Like I felt, right. I, I was in the same headspace that I was when I was working on a Heartland. Like I got all this flexibility, let's come up with some cool weapon behaviors and make them function, all that cool stuff. And so it's hard to compare them, I guess, because it's kind of, um, I, I don't like using this phrase because it's, it's too corporate geeky, but it's, it's literally a paradigm shift. Like it's, if you, if you haven't used any of these tools yet, and you're interested at all in doing any sort of dehacked work, please, 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 please give them a try because Definitely. they they make a huge difference. Like I I feel so late because it's like I'm partially tooting my own horn because I'm telling people to use a standard I helped develop. But okay. like we didn't we didn't just bullshit this into existence because we thought it you know we wanted to make it ourselves. Like this is legit something that the community as a whole will benefit from. Like this is this is the missing link that boom wads have needed for decades now and yeah, it's, sure. it's picking up so yeah definitely a, a little preachy right. on my part <laughs> but um yeah so it, it was just freeing like being able to work on that and not have to worry about oh fuck i gotta sift through the state table and oh i can't do x because there's no way to do it in vanilla like it's vanilla mapping you can do all sorts of cool shit with like if you keep the vis planes into account, there's all sorts of crazy shit you can do with maps. Yeah. With dehacked, you just start hitting walls almost immediately. Like mm -hmm. knee deep and knee deep and zoom shows there's a whole lot of really cool fucking shit you can do even with dehacked. So like you know I'm 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 saying that and I guess it's technically a lie because yes there's there's plenty of stuff you can still do but I guess to me it's always felt like that was more the limiting factor than than maps. But that's also because I came from like G zoom like gameplay modding was my thing for the longest time. And so I, I in my head, I've always compared things to that. So um, the stuff you could do in a vanilla dehacked mod just always felt so limited compared to what you could do in a map or in GZ Doom or in Eternity or any other port. And there's, there's acceptance. Um, like Wrecker, of course, did fucking amazing stuff in vanilla. So it's certainly not impossible, but it just always felt like it was a very dollar store <laughs> compared to everything else's fanciness. Yeah, and so <laughs> TLDR, I'm happy with the new stuff. There's certainly some things we could have done. Um, I don't know if that means there's going to be an MBF 23 or 24 or something. 22 is a bit late. <laughs> um, we're running out of time in the year for that. Right. But I think at this point, I, I whatever the next sort of like major shift is, um, I'm I'm not necessarily like I doubt it'll come for me like whatever that is I might be around I might not I don't know but um, the fact that the port is still getting like cool shit actually tell you what there is there is one cool new thing that's coming out in the future that I don't know if it's on your list at all because it hasn't been announced uh -huh. um, have you seen anything about the new uh, OpenGL Index Light mode and DSDA Doom uh, yeah I saw on Vile's uh, Vile stream. He got like mm -hmm. a beta version of uh, DSTA, I believe, which is really cool because I'm a software person, but obviously uh, GL just has better performance. So it's kind of a best of both worlds situation for someone like me. Yep. Yeah, same here. So um, for those listening in that don't know what the hell I'm talking about, um, the next release of DSDA Doom uh, has an option that makes the GL renderer use the same uh light calculations of software like it uses the color map and and uses that to fade so 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 you know barring some funny you know OpenGL not supporting every vanilla mapping glitchy trick aside the whole idea is that you can flip on OpenGL and it'll look virtually undistinguishable from software mode that's the goal yeah um it's not per it's not perfect yet there's still like some things we gotta fix specters aren't right um there's some bugs 
there's a, the flat calculations are a little off, so the fading isn't exactly perfect. Um, I can't take credit for the idea. This is a uh, Jazz Mickle, uh, Queen Jazz did this uh, for her not a source part. Thank you, <laughs> nasty. Uh, the the kind of Unity Doom thing that she was working on and just posted a blog about it. And I've just for ages wanted to try to sneak this thing into a Doom port for real because um, I just really like how color map fades look. Like you can do all sorts of great stuff by changing the color map and. It just doesn't look quite the same in GL. Um, so yeah, well, I mean, shadow contrast and stuff for me is the big thing. Uh, yeah, in software and, and GL, the way GL handles brightness differentials and stuff, just I'm not sure. It, it never looks the same. Please play Fracture Worlds in software. That's what I'm saying. Yes, the other thing <laughs> that um, I think is a major difference is dark areas always have some amount of distinguishable contrast in Doom, uh, in classic software lighting, to where you can you can put something at zero brightness and you can still tell an imp is there because you can see the outlines of their spikes. Yeah, yeah. And so in GL mode, when you start making the sectors a whole lot darker, even if it's using a, a Doom style, like shader fade kind of effect, like um, DSDA Doom shader mode or GZ Doom softer or vanilla light modes, dark areas still just look darker in GL because um, it's doing real calculations, and so those colors are getting a whole lot. Like a, you lose the contrast, if that makes sense. So yeah. the funny thing about it is that's what actually spawned this whole thing. Is there was a discussion in speedrunning Discord where people were like, "Hey, I'm using GL, and I got to turn the gamma up because I can't see shit." And then some other people were like, "Oh fuck! If I use this, the pain palette sucks, and I can't see shit when you take damage." Yeah. And so, and and one of the things that I kind of saw was that some people were like. Hey, it works fine in software mode, but none of these GL lighting options work for me unless I crank the gamma up to a bazillion or, you know, change the pain fades or whatever. And so it, that sort of is what got the gears turning again on this idea of can you do Doom's lighting, like software lighting in GL? And the answer is you can, absolutely. It's just a case of can you do it? Yeah. Um, I would love for this to be something in GZ Doom as well, but that's a lot harder because by by nature to use the color map you have to you have to clamp all your graphics to the palette and fundamentally gz doom is a true color port first whereas pr boom and dsda doom they have true color features but you can turn them all off they're all an optional yeah, extension right. that you kind of just have fallbacks for like, like sunlust has um high def skies that are true color but there's also a it, you have to have a fallback version of them for them to work in software mode. And so mm -hmm. you can always comfortably like just say, okay, when you're in this light mode, just use the software version of this. So you have a you have a reliable fallback to a 256 color mode in DSDA Doom, and you can't do that in GZ Doom. Like you have to solve the problem of okay, if it's true color, what do you do with a true color graphic to get it to clamp to the palette? And that's hard. Um so anyhow. That's something I would also love to do because the end goal of all of this stuff, as silly as it is, the Adventures of Square doesn't look right to us in GL mode because the color ramps are meant to fade into like saturated colors. So like the really bright yellows are meant to go to like like really saturated yellow. And we use the color map for that. The problem is that when you mathematically take like a really bright pale yellow and dark in it, it, it looks dull and not not it's it's not it's not saturated. It doesn't it doesn't look the same. Yeah. And so in OpenGL in Square, the colors just look really dull. But if you switch it to software mode, then um, the performance of the maps sucks balls because some idiot named Zazer made all his maps way too fucking big. <laughs> <laughs> so. So it's literally like, man, I would love it if we could ship it in GL and fix the lighting so I could, I guess, atone for my sins. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, got to put those personal fixes in, you know? <laughs> yeah, there you go. It all comes back to that. No, it's, um, still, though, it's, it, you have your cake and eat it, too. Like, GL is just better performance. Graphic cards have been a thing for many decades now. Software mode is not a relic because we like how it looks, but yeah. the 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 compelling reasons to use it like 
it would be nice if those things could be done in GL as well, or I said GL hardware, because Vulcan's the thing, <laughs> showing my yeah. age here. Well, I mean, I think people just have no excuse not to use software now. That's my opinion. It's I just better. <laughs> it's objectively better. That's really the end of it, I think. It looks great. It's, it's, <laughs> you click on that face. Um, it does. Anyhow, really. it's, it hasn't really been announced yet, and, but, the next version will have that, and at some point I need to make a Doom World post explaining what the hell this is, what does that mean. Um, it's I'm been hinted at a little bit in the thread, but yeah, uh, hopefully folks get a kick out of it, and you know I'm sure there's going to be bugs, and we'll fix them up. Mm-hmm. The only thing that's a little spooky is a uh, as much like long term like Craft Lab and I have talked a little bit, and it would be so cool if we could just make that the default. Right. But the trouble is, there's also so many like rendering tricks and quirks and things that just don't work in gl like um i don't i i I don't know if this has been fixed in pr plus upstream but like back to center next map one uses that flat bleeding trick to make a 3d bridge like the the more death bridges as they're called yeah and that just doesn't it doesn't work in gl like it it doesn't know to draw the flats quote unquote wrong so it's just abusing a quirk of doom software render to make a cool looking effect and there's so much of that in Doom that it's a really, really tall order to ship a renderer that um, does all that accurately. And there's been a lot of great work in the last couple of years. Uh, Jading Tsunami in particular has been a beast, committing all sorts of fixes upstream to PR+, Plus, making its GL renderer better. Um, but there's still a long way to go, I guess, before it hits that point where it's close enough to feature parity where you can just like flip that on and it'll work for most things. Because... There's there's still a lot of notable wads that just don't look correct, and if you flip that on, if that makes sense, so it still may be a good idea to ship it as the default, and then you can change it if it doesn't work right. But um, it's not yet a drop in replacement, if that makes sense. It'd be great if it was, but it's just not there yet. Yeah, well, so. a lot of exciting things to come, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. But uh, so I suppose now on to this is the final question. It's the big one. Uh, I ask everyone. I don't know if you've listened to the other podcasts, but um, this is the one that I ask everybody at the end. Uh, <laughs> but what is your favorite Doom monster and why? Oh, uh, Revenants, the best monster in the game. Whoa, Whoa not even didn't even take a second. Usually, people have nope. to think a little bit, but you were just straight no. Out it's the game. uh, it's Revenants. Uh, it's funny too because I have an old post where I just go on about how much I love the things, but um. They're the most versatile monster in the game. You can use them as snipers. You can use them as glass cannons. You can they they just their existence puts a threat on you because their seeking missiles just encourage interesting behavior. You got to move when they're around. Mm-hmm. Doom is a game about movement, and they encourage it like crazy. Um, there's just so many cool ways you can use them as a melee monster because they'll punch your ass off. Um, yep. But there are so many cool ways that you can use revenants that I, I get why people don't like them, but. But I, more than any other monster in the game, like I, you can do so much stuff with a single revenant placed placed smartly, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, there are so many aspects to them. Uh, yep. Their size, being able to chase the player, their speed mm-hmm. and stuff, uh, makes them uh, a lot better at moving through maps that are difficult right. to traverse for other monsters as well, which is great. Yeah, they also don't have a crap ton of hp so so like you can even use them in areas where like maybe you only have a single shotgun like so so they can be used as a high tier monster for early early maps pretty comfortably like it's harder to do that with say an arch file because the health gap is high enough that it starts becoming a chore to fight them unless you give the player a slightly more powerful weapon so i can see people making a good case for other monsters like arch files cyber demon is the other kind of big candidate for best monster but i guess both of those guys, as awesome as they are, like they're a bit more limited in how you can use them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you can do some amazing shit with it, but like hands down, Revenant, best monster in the game. I will, I will go to my grave <laughs> saying that. I'll probably become one, rising from my grave one day. Uh, you can only hope. Much more interesting yeah. way to be in the afterlife, I think. Is yeah, probably. exactly. You know, so join the skeleton army, but get some cool rocket launchers. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, so so there we go. There's there's my there's my non hesitation answer there. Um, great so great you, answer. Yeah, you're in good company. Yeah. Um. <laughs> this is funny too because there's so many people that hear that. I'm like, God damn it! Why did you pick that one? I hate that. Uh, but totally understand that they're a very controversial bastard of a beast. But they they will always be my favorite. So no, fantastic versatile uh, enemy for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Well, yeah, I guess that that brings a, this episode to a close. Uh, 
thank you very much for coming on um you've made so much stuff over such a long period of time uh contributed to the com uh, community in like a, a massive amount of ways so uh you were definitely someone i had on my list pretty early on and maybe got to you criminally late yeah but uh yeah it, it was great to have you on and and thanks for sharing your insights um, thanks so much for having me here. This is fun. It's uh, it's always fun to talk about the stuff. I hope I haven't rambled too terribly much about it, but I'm <laughs> no, kind of flattered. No. Still flattered that after like 20 years of being here, people are like, "Yeah, let's talk to this person." Like, I guess it's a good sign I haven't faded into obscurity yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. Going. Um, but yeah, thanks and thanks to Rubix for pointing things out and for giving you the skinny on a few things. So seriously, thanks everybody. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again. And um. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I will be back next time with another very mysterious guest. Uh, maybe even to me. Uh, no, I actually know who it's going to be. But you'll have to wait. So yeah. Uh, thanks and uh, goodbye.